The flora and fauna of the abandoned world of Parias has changed considerably since humanity left the planet to fend for itself five million years ago. During these five million years, a natural trend towards a warming climate is quite evident. The Arctic and Antarctic ice caps in this world have long since melted, with almost no place on the planet having year-round snowfall. Due to this warming trend, the seas rose and the climates changed significantly. When the seas rose, they drastically reshaped the supercontinent into something barely recognizable. Primarily, the western tip of this continent was the first to break away, becoming the long landmass of Lucindo. Lucindo split early, geologically speaking, being the first major isolated climate. To the east is what remains of the ancient supercontinent, with three major landmasses being connected by short land bridges. The first and arguably largest of these continents is Belkreik. This landmass exists on the south side of the Riftala Sea, the largest rift valley on the planet. Connected to Bell Creek by a thread is the peninsula of Nanuk on the west and the large island of Haidar Og in the east. Connected by the Dizdoyatin land bridge is the continent of Kamna, with the Nayak Islands off its northern coast. In the north, connected to Kamna by the Ekul land bridge is Payax. Payax exists on the north side of the Riftala Sea, with many islands off the coast of this continent, especially on its southern end. The seas have changed considerably as well in the past five million years. The polar regions where the ice caps resided have been flooded into oblivion, being replaced by shallow seas. The Nutu Sea reaches around the far north and the Jawan Sea in the far south. There are considerable places of importance in the rest of the world's ocean, one of which is the Grinding Gulf. The Grinding Gulf can be found off of eastern Bell Creek and southern Kamna, and is significant due to high levels of tectonic activity in the region. This part of the world is plagued with earthquakes, tsunamis, and minor levels of volcanism. Another region is the Flamio Sea, which can be found off of the coast of Lucindo and has the highest levels of volcanism on the planet. In this part of Parias, undersea volcanoes can be seen barely poking out of the great ocean. The north holds the Mammon Sea, named for its protruding continental shelf that causes significant dry weather on the western side of Kamna. The continents aren't the only thing that has changed in this strange new world, but the climate has drastically changed as well. On Lucindo, a large rainforest and savanna stretches in the north, only stopped by a young mountain range. These mountains block rains to a large desert on the northwest of Lucindo. In the south, a small temperate band exists, giving way to a small and cold region in southern Lucindo. This place gets a solid amount of rain, with an exception to the flat plateaus of southwest Lucindo. Bell Creek also has a large tropical belt, with its fair share of jungles, savannas, and deserts alike. A gargantuan mountain range exists in the center of this land, dividing most of the tropics from the rest of the continent. The temperate region is the smallest in the world here. Ka'amna is generally one of the drier places on the planet, with a large desert in the center where rains don't fall. However, on the far east of this continent, the largest rainforest on the planet exists. Also, the Nawiyak Islands to the northeast are considerably colder and wetter than the rest of the rather hot continent, with these isles experiencing seasonal snowfall in the dead of winter. Payax is the least changed landmass in the last 5 million years when examining its climate. Most of the region is wet and temperate, with a subtropical strip of territory on the southern coast. Most of the land in this region is similar to the diversity of climates found in North America. Parias is a warmer world than that of Earth, but there are other factors to consider that make this world different than what we would consider normal. For starters, Parias is a smaller world, with a gravity of only 90% of that of Earth's. Despite the smaller gravity, the atmosphere is roughly 1.1 times that of Earth's, with a composition of 25% oxygen, 1% argon, 73.5% nitrogen, and 0.5% of other gases. 
Parias is a younger planet than that of Earth, and its young age can be seen in its faster day-night cycle, completing a rotation once every 21 Earth hours. Given its longer orbit around a binary star pair, one year on Parias consists of around 551 Earth days, or around 630 Parian days. Whilst the land and seas of Parias have changed a lot after humans abandoned the planet, the life left behind has also changed in this time, adapting to many niches that are vacant on this world. The next video will start to delve into the evolved species on Parias and how they have changed from their ancestors without the influence of their former caretakers. At every level, the planet of Nakari 1011C has seen many Earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment light years away from Earth. In just 5 million years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and this series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Parias. In this episode, we take ourselves to the western continent of Lucindo and more significantly examine the boreal forests of its southern edge. This portion of the continent is unique in two ways. For one, it is the only portion of the landmass that exists in Parias's Antarctic Circle. Because of the extreme 35 degree axial tilt of the planet, the southern region of Lucindo experiences the phenomenon of midnight sun, or well, in this case, midnight suns. Summers in this part of the world have days dominated by sunlight where night is absent, and winters have entire days where the sun does not rise. This can cause extreme seasonal variation, but is often cold for most of the year, with snowfall often landing in this region in the dark of winter. The second important geographic feature to take into consideration is the high plateaus to the north of this bioregion. These large, high flatlands cause a large barrier for ground-dwelling animals, blocking many species from opening available niches. Despite these challenges, however, life, of course, finds a way. When the ancient ice fields melted away soon after humans left Parias, the whole region was open for life to colonize, fill new niches, and thrive. One of the first and arguably strangest groups to adapt to this cold region is the colonial aspen, a species of aspen tree that eventually grew to dominate the region. It may seem surprising that a rather humble tree species would single-branchedly become the top tree in a whole bioregion, but their secrets lie under the surface. Much of their success can be attributed to their colonial lifestyle. All aspen trees in these colonies are duplicates of each other, and all trees in a colony connect their root systems in a tangled up mess. These roots have a mutually beneficial relationship with a special fungus species that has specialized to being symbiotic to the aspen trees, which help in the gaining of nutrients and the timing of abscission in the autumn. Because of them, the entire colony's leaves will turn yellow and dump in almost perfect synchrony. On top of this amazing adaptation, these trees, similarly to eusocial insects, have adapted a caste system surrounding a single queen aspen tree. The queen is guarded by a ring or two of guard trees, with gnarled roots and stems that make access to the center of the colony more trouble than it is worth for herbivores. This protection ensures the continuation of a colony, as the death of a queen means a swift end for the rest of the colony. Due to this system, the colonial aspen evolved to rapidly take over stretches of land that other large trees could not cover as quickly, carving out a niche all to themselves. Whilst the colonial aspen has become the dominant tree of their region, they are not the only plants to call these extreme lands home. Some species of crabgrass have also evolved to live in this strange territory, adapting into two unique genera that cope differently to the harsh conditions. Monover grass, much as their name implies, are annual grasses that will produce massive amounts of seeds in the autumn, only for them to die when winter rolls in. The seeds lie dormant until spring comes, the cue of which will trigger the seeds that made it through winter to grow and continue the cycle all over again. Polyver grasses, on the other hand, take more time 
in a more long-lived approach, growing more slowly and saving resources in their roots under the ground. When winter comes, the resources gathered from summer sunlight and stored away will carry the plant through the winter, allowing it to live for more than a year. A significant flowering plant of the region can be seen growing in the shadows of the great aspen colonies. Simple patches of year bloom blanket flower grow in the spring and summer, spreading across the region and taking advantage of the long summers for fast growth. The descendants of Indian blanket flower, these plants are one of the most beautiful flowers in the region. However, when winter rolls around, these plants will also die in similar way to the monover grass, but many of their seeds will survive and regrow into the next generation when spring comes. These flowers come in an incredible range of diverse colors, often in stark contrast to the lush greens of spring and summer. Other simple, ground-dwelling plants exist in the region as well. Other simple, ground-dwelling plants exist in the region, many of which have similar adaptations that allow them to survive the long winters. The Lucindan common moss and the great wood moss are plants that have not changed much from their ancestors but both are hardy enough to survive the conditions, with spores or other adaptations that allow them to thrive. However, a unique species that shares a common ancestor with the Lucindan common moss has taken to the trees. Hanging moss can be found across most of southern Lucindo, thriving and exploring the branches up above. When the time comes for them to reproduce, they produce a bunch of spores on their hanging body in the hopes that an insect or bird will touch it and spread the spores to another tree. Hanging moss isn't the only plant that took to the trees in becoming epiphytic. Evercreep tomatoes have become a key part of the ecosystem as well. These bizarre descendants of domestic tomatoes have become an ivy-like epiphytic plant, spending the majority of its life on the branches of colonial aspen trees. It has done this due to competition with ground-dwelling species, as those more effectively take up the ground space of southern Lucindo. Some species of these tomatoes have adapted to being parasitic in nature, siphoning nutrients from their host to allow them to grow faster. This tomato descendant has evolved smaller and less acidic fruits, allowing for easier consumption via birds or insects. When the bird eats the tomato, there's a high likelihood that the seeds will pass the digestive tract of the bird and end up on the branch of a new tree, allowing the circle of life for these strange plants to continue. Coming back down to the ground, a humble fern can be detected among the aspens. The ever fern is a small and slow-growing species of fern that has adapted for a harsher climate, using nutrients that would have assisted in a growing taller to store away for the long winter. These nutrients produced via photosynthesis are found all over the plant body, which would make this plant a delectable target for large herbivores. Thankfully, this plant has adapted to have a scale-like exterior that makes consumption rather difficult. All of these plants have adapted to the region well, but many other life have also adapted to the harsh conditions of the southern polar circle to exploit the new environment. Many of these animals migrated from the lands to the east, bypassing the Lucindan high plateaus in the process. Just as the plants have adapted to this climate, the fungal life have also adapted in unique ways to survive. They haven't changed as much during this time, as much of their lifespans occur in the soil. However, they do deserve being documented just like the other forms of life on Parias as they too fill essential roles in the ecosystem that they find themselves in. The spotted Nepsa, much like the colonial aspen reigning supreme in the region, have become the dominant form of fungal life. The spotted Nepsa is a couple of species within a genus that contains fungi that thrive due to their symbiotic relationship with the colonies of aspen trees. Whilst being symbiotic, they are not exclusively so, providing other services such as consumers of dead organic material. Their fruit bodies are often eaten by animals as they are very much edible, which helps with the distribution of their spores. Another fungal species that has adapted to this region is known as the snakeskin rot. 
and thrives across South Lucindo. Being able to metabolize lignin, this fungus is essential for quickly getting rid of dead or dying aspen trees. They have adapted to survive the winters by slowing metabolism rates, and can be easily spotted by showing a scaly appearance on the log that is being consumed. This humble coloration can allow for them to sometimes get an animal to touch their fruit bodies and disperse it elsewhere, allowing for this species to propagate itself. Not found in just southern Lucindo, but across most of the continent is the common shine shroom. This agaric descendant hasn't changed too much from their ancestors, but have made a unique adaptation that can allow them to disperse with greater efficiency. Their fruit bodies have intense amounts of chemicals that induce psychedelic effects on the consumer. Under the cap of this mushroom lies a large amount of spores, with at least some of them making it through the guts of whatever's eating them and being distributed through their droppings. Whilst not the most glorious method of dispersal, it is effective as many animals will eat this shine shroom species to gain euphoric feelings and pain relief. Not all species in this region are as generalist as the shine shroom or key to the environment as the snakeskin rot. The hidden in flower is not a plant, but a fungus species, descendants of the cinnamon polypore that has adapted to be a parasite of the evercreep tomato. When the host is infected, the species will bore into the veins of the tomato host and grow a large flower-like fruiting body. These flower-mimicking mushrooms rely on the pollinator confusing its fruiting body from the actual flowers of the tomato plant. When chosen over the real plant, the pollinator will get spores all over themselves and spread the infection from plant to plant, allowing the parasitic fungus to continue their harsh circle of life. Hidden among the mosses and grass are a humble entourage of small animal life that call this region home. Whilst these invertebrates may not be as charismatic as some of the larger and more dangerous creatures, they also deserve to be mentioned in this episode. After a gentle brush of rain has blown over the aspen forests, one can often see a common loosened worm squirm across the soil. Spending most of their time underground eating decaying material in the soil, they have not changed significantly from their ancestors. These worms just happen to be more resilient to seasonal variation. A key adaptation that has allowed these worms to stretch their range across half a continent is their ability to secrete a mucus that coats their body, acting as a protective coating against the cold of winter. This allows many worms to survive when the conditions get better, given they aren't disturbed in this state. Moving slowly across damp moss beds, polar snails thrive in the warm and wet summers that bask the region. The polar snail has adapted a similar survival strategy to the Lucindan common worm, but take it a unique step further. These snails, when autumn comes and the days get cut short, will eat more than they usually do and mate before finding a place to undergo hibernation. In this state, these snails will incubate their eggs right next to them, with the parent snail sharing the goopy winter blanket with the next generation of snails. When spring rolls around, the young snails will leave their parent to continue the strange and slow circle of life. Of course, not every animal has similar adaptations to survive the long and harsh winters of these regions. One group that has uniquely adapted for this environment is the jade wood beetle, Given that many wood-boring species of insects were not taken to Prius, some beetles have adapted to fill that vacant niche. The larvae of this beetle species will burrow deep into trees, preferring dead over living ones. When they become adults, the beetles will search for mates and lay as many eggs as possible before winter comes. When winter does arrive, the adults will die as the larvae remain dormant under the bark until winter clears away. Being one of the most successful clades of animals, a bee descendant has made the transition to survive in this climate. The adorably named cuddle bee is named such for its hibernation behavior in winter. In the spring and summer, the hive of these eusocial insects pollinate the flowers mentioned previously, preferring the blanket flower over other species. When winter comes along and their food supply is gone, these bees will close off most of their hive and group up pushing together like sardines. 
as they vibrate their abdomens, their body heat will ensure that the queen survives and can continue to lead the colony. As many organisms have adapted to survive the harsh winter, some have evolved to simply leave for warmer grounds and come back when the cold recedes. The lanternfly, a large descendant of the firefly, has become a true sight to behold. Over seven centimeters in length when fully grown, these insects have opted for a longer lifespan. They avoid the short fate of the jade wood beetle with migratory behavior. When autumn hits, the lanternflies will glow to alert others of their species that it's time to go. Eventually, they will fly northward in gargantuan swarms, thousands strong in number. The swarms will eventually land north, where they feast in a climate not as ravaged as their southern homelands. Lanternflies will mate in the autumn before leaving, and the firefly larvae will lay in dormancy. When the swarms come back south to mate again, a new generation of lanternflies will join the elders and replenish any lost along the way. Another species that tends to migrate is the polychrome streamhawk, the descendant of a dragonfly that live mostly in the plateaus to the north, but will come down to the more humid environment of South Lucindo. However, since their eggs are more adapted for surviving warmer waters, populations down here are not significant in comparison to their homeland. Despite this, they are prolific predators that can take down anything their size or smaller with deathly efficiency. Given that this part of the world isn't their homeland, we are going to cover these lovely insects in much more detail in a future episode. However, the true queens of the invertebrate world are the Lucindan fur spiders. Being the descendant of the jumping spider, they have undergone the most extreme changes by any of the life listed so far. The first adaptation is a more intense coating of a fur-like structure, allowing the spider to easily adapt to this environment. Due to the lack of competition from other spiders or arthropods, they have grown in size from their ancestors to exploit the apex predator role of the undergrowth. Their gigantism has also been a useful adaptation for surviving the cold environment, as larger animals do better in colder climates as they don't lose heat as fast. However, this large size means that their ancestral hunting and hiding strategies don't work as well, even given the lower gravity of pariahs. To counter this, they have evolved to dig small burrows and use ambush tactics to dispatch prey. These tactics of ambush hunting are so effective that they can often take down prey even larger than they are, which is impressive given that they are already the size of a softball. The rivers, ponds, and lakes of this realm are common and pocket the lands of South Lucindo like Swiss cheese. Due to the massive ice sheets melting away only 5 million years ago, many freshwater bodies were left behind as remnants of their icy forces. Given how new these lakes and rivers are in the region, many animals had to recently adapt to the situation here, which has resulted in a pretty low amount of diversity. The thin goby, or Gracioli, is a family of fishes that thrive across most of the rivers and estuaries across the continent of Lucindo, and especially here in the rivers of South Lucindo. Their adaptive nature and small size has allowed them to diversify into a variety of species and genera, from the humble 5 cm spotted thingoby to the 40 cm blue skin thingoby. Most of the species are adaptable omnivores, eating anything they can fit in their mouths. Another goby species has specifically adapted to the region. The common ice fry has adapted to live further upriver and thrive in creeks and streams and small lakes. Their small bodies and rapid life cycle allows them to quickly colonize waters that they find themselves in. On top of this, they have adapted a fairly unique adaptation that allows them to survive the winters better. They have adapted an antifreeze agent in their blood, like the ice fish of Earth. Because of this, they can do just fine in the cold of winter, even when the surface of the lakes and rivers above them freeze over. They thrive in aquatic algae and plant material, but might attack worms and small insects unfortunate enough to get into the waters when given the chance. However, a close relative of the common ice fry has adapted for a more aggressive role compared to their algae-loving cousins. 
Living upriver but occasionally coming down to brackish waters, these fish have adapted to a predatory role. The eel goby has adapted a row of sharp teeth, which allows them to easily eat common ice fry, worms, snails, and anything else they can catch. They sometimes even eat small rodents and birds unfortunate enough to find themselves near the water's edge. They have a lengthened body, and given that their ancestors lack scales due to neoteny, the eel goby has thick skin that allows them to slime their way into nooks and crannies. However, these eel-like fish aren't the only ones who predate these waters. The swamp moray is the dominant fish in fresh and brackish waters of South Lucindo, and their length of around 130 centimeters as adults makes them the largest freshwater fish in the whole area. These eels recently migrated into the area from up north, and the key to their survivability in the freshwater streams and lakes is due to a high amount of osmoregulatory cells. These specialized cells keep the body at balance in both salt and fresh water. They eat other fish and aquatic arthropods and anything else they can catch. Sometimes, due to the high amounts of osmoregulatory cells, these eels will sometimes come onto land and migrate from one body of water to another. They can only last on dry land for a few dozen minutes before they dry out and die. Whilst these fish have adapted to stay in these small, fresh waters for their whole lives, other fish will use the lengthened summers to spawn upriver and go back out to warmer ocean water in the winters. The largest fish in the region are the titanic shielded sturgeon. The large descendants of Atlantic sturgeon, they have adapted uniquely to become one of, if not the largest benthic feeder on Piraeus. They feed on mollusks, crustaceans, worms, and detritus. Their keratinous armor makes them almost impervious to predation, especially when fully grown. This armoring is mostly covered at the head region of the animal, almost resembling the long extinct placoderms of Earth. The species is sexually dimorphic, with males being smaller yet more armored than the females. Females of the species gain sexual maturity at 25 perine years and males at 10. Every three to four years in the spring, females will migrate as upriver as their large bodies can bring them before laying tens of thousands of eggs in a single spawning, with the eggs being guarded by her mate. The dad will stay behind and watch his young hatch, some of which he does eat to ensure he survives the growth of the young. At the same time, he'll make sure nothing else gets close to the egg site, and will attack anything else around aggressively, sometimes dying in the process. Afterwards, the males will guide their young downriver and stay with them for another lunar cycle or two before running out of fat reserves and leaving the young to survive on their own. This extended parental guidance allows many of the fish to survive their first year, but not many will make it to sexual maturity given the harsh seas. This allows the species to become absolute titans, with the largest females being around 6 meters long and weighing 600 kilograms. Salmon, another iconic fish that migrate into rivers to spawn, also thrive in this region. Specifically, the sharp-toothed salmon is the salmon species that dominates the southern seas, just like how the Chinook salmon, their ancestor, patrol the Alaskan waters of Earth. As adults, these salmon thrive off of eating other fish and migrating to warmer waters in the winter. When these fish become old enough, they will return to the rivers that they hatched in spawn ridiculous amounts of eggs, and soon afterwards die off. The fry will hatch and make it down river in a time rush, as they have to grow large enough to live in the salty seas before the winter comes in. Unfortunately, given the harsh conditions this far south, many amphibians and reptiles would not thrive down here. The darkness of winter and relative lack of places to migrate away to escape the cold via land means that most of these large exothermic creatures would likely die and not establish a population. On the other hand, just like almost every environment we see today, birds can be found thriving. These adaptable modern theropods find no exceptions here, and can also be found here in great diversity just like how they are adapted to on Earth. 
first, covering the more cosmopolitan species seems to be most important, as one can see the requirements that an animal may need to survive in a specific environment. One such global species is the peacock head, a duck not too different from their wood duck ancestors. They can be found almost anywhere on the planet during this time period, from the tropics down to the polar regions. They can essentially be found anywhere where clean and fresh bodies of water can be found. They are omnivores, eating anything they can catch in the waters. A key adaptation that differentiates them from their ancestors is their sexual dimorphism. Males have an extravagant crest of feathers on their heads, with red eye spots that make them attractive to females of their species. Males with the most colorful heads get the attention of females, but to the point of their own detriment, as their colorful nature makes them stick out like a sore thumb. This is especially true in the polar regions of the planet, such as South Lucindo. The false rails are also a cosmopolitan species, and have many similar adaptations to the peacock head. They thrive best in swamps, bogs, and wetlands, but some populations thrive in southern Lucindo, especially in the summer months. Whilst their wings and musculature don't make them the best flyers in terms of speed, they are great at covering long distances, and groups of the species will migrate regularly. Given their slow flight, they are often blown off course, which has allowed them to colonize many islands of Prius and introduce them to new environments where they can exploit more resources. The false rails nest on the ground in a large social group called a supple, and the supple will collectively guard a nest site as one group, chasing off anything that might come their way with surprising levels of confidence. Being adaptable omnivores and having very generalist lifestyles, these birds are some of the most common ones to spot at this time period in any habitable terrestrial environment. Despite these adaptable birds thriving almost anywhere on Parias, some other birds have specialized to fit in well with this region specifically. One of these birds is the leaf duck, finding itself anywhere in southern Lucindo where plenty of trees and insects are found. They are mostly arboreal creatures and are generally poor flyers. Their limited flight is because of their dietary shift towards leaves and insects in the trees which is very low in caloric value. They often don't swim like their ancestors do, but sometimes come to the water to catch something to supplement their diet. They will also eat evercreep tomatoes when given the chance. Another bird that has adapted for a mostly fallover's lifestyle is the massive, dazzling zimu. Persisting across southern Lucindo from the temperate grasslands down to the polar region, these birds have become the largest birds on the planet to ever fly. Weighing around 50 kilograms and with a wingspan of around 4 meters, they are ginormous when compared to their ancestors. One may ask how or why they have adapted to becoming this large, and the answer to both comes in their diet. They spend the majority of their time eating tubers and grasses, migrating in huge herds from location to location, wherever resources are low. These animals have the ability to still fly despite their large size, due to the lower gravity of Parias, being 90% of Earth's. This lower gravity enables larger creatures to fly than Earth ever could. However, sometimes these animals can be vulnerable when on full stomachs when ambushed by a predator. They do have a capacity to fight back, with strong muscular legs and a nasty bite, but these defenses are no match for some of the predators in the region. The turquoise hair jay may not be as impressive as their larger competition in the region, but their adaptive lifestyle, relatively high intelligence, and small size allows these birds to carve out a niche for themselves in such a diverse yet harsh climate. On top of this, the species has adapted a unique mating system and migratory pattern that allows them to bypass the worst parts about living on this far south on the continent. When autumn comes along, males will show off their bright bluish-green feathers to attract a mate, and when one is impressed by their display, the pair will fly off together northwest to the subtropical lands of West Lucindo, and will raise chicks there together. In the spring, the pair and their young will fly back to their homeland and soon afterwards split up, 
starting the cycle all over again. Whilst many of the birds in this part of the world are omnivorous, adapting to be generalist enough to eat any resource they can find, some have not adapted this way. The elder owl is the descendant of the snowy owl and is a true sight to behold. With a lack of eagle and hawk competition in the area, this owl has adapted to not only hunt in the dark of the night, but also attack in the middle of the day. This adaptation was required in this region, as the midnight sun in the summers of this region means that there is much of the year where the owl would be unable to hunt or have very little time to complete a hunt. They have retained the noise-canceling wing feathers of their ancestors alongside their mostly white coloring. The retained feature of white coloring is helpful even in the summers due to the dominance of aspen forests in the region, keeping white coloration beneficial even without snow. These owls got to take advantage of this feature, adapting shorter but wider wings perfectly adapted for the dense forests that they call home. Their wing shape is great for maneuverability, allowing them to stealthily ambush prey in the region. Mice, squirrels, small birds, and pretty much anything smaller than them is at their mercy. Unlike their ancestors and other owls, which are generally not very bright, these owls have slightly higher intelligence to more easily maneuver through the forest. The intelligence of this predatory bird has led it to a unique situation. Depicted in the image is an elder owl combating a false quoll, the descendant of the Virginia opossum. These animals often eat similar prey and end up competing for similar kills. Because of this, the two species have become bitter rivals, and will try to kill each other if either is given the chance. Unlike the amphibians and reptiles, mammals have been the most successful group of animals that call this region home. Their adaptive heterodonty, fur, and live birth all are useful features that allow them to thrive in colder climates. Unlike birds, however, many mammals don't migrate out of the south in the winter as many of them, especially the smaller ones, have to walk around the mountains instead of fly. Despite being the smallest and humblest of mammals in the area, the black prairie mouse has unique behaviors and adaptations that allows them to do well in South Lucindo. As omnivores, they eat and chew through lots of materials, but they have a preference for insect larvae, given that they are excellent sources of fat and protein. They are the most prolific species around, as members of the species become fully grown within a single Parian lunar cycle. Because of this, their population booms in the spring and summer, given the rise of insects and fruits. In the autumn, these mice will build a massive nest made dozens or sometimes a hundred strong. The mice will huddle to keep warm for most of the winter, as they do not hibernate like many other species do at the time. Coming from up north, the minor marmot is an orangish red furred groundhog descendant that has a more fossorial and social lifestyle. Living in mostly monogamous pairs, the species builds extensive burrows underground and often intersect with other pairs. Despite having a single main mate, males and females alike of this species will often cheat on their mate with another. This can cause a more social cohesion among groups of minor marmots. As for males, any young of a nearby female could be potentially theirs. The young of these groundhogs will spend the first year of their lives in their parents' burrows, and will help their parents care for their younger siblings for a bit before being ejected to find their own mate and nest of their own. A close cousin of the ground-loving minor marmots is the more branch-climbing tree marmot, capable of moving greatly in the aspen trees that they call home. Being a semi-arboreal species, they don't often compete with the animals on the ground. They eat tubers, nuts, and leaves, and have short gray fur. Like their close relatives, they are monogamous, but unlike the minor marmots, they don't cheat nearly as commonly on their mates. These marmots aren't the only animals that specialized in climbing trees here, and share the arboreal stage with the big-eared squirrel. The big-eared squirrel is a unique descendant of the eastern gray squirrel, 
that has adapted for an insectivorous lifestyle. Their fur is thicker, which makes stings and bites from insects hard to do. Their large ears grants them a great level of hearing sensibility, so sensitive that the squirrel can hear insects in the wood of trees. On top of that, their sharper incisors allow these squirrels to quickly catch and dispatch any insect prey that they find in the trees or on the ground. These traits make this squirrel have an equal matchup with the massive fur spider, which is a risky encounter for both species. The minor marmots and the big-eared squirrels have to keep an eye out, as one of the animals that will readily eat them is the false quoll, an opportunistic mesocarnivore that does just as well in the trees as they do on the ground. These marsupials are the descendants of the Virginia opossum, and took the vacant role of arboreal predator that would have been claimed by felids if they were brought to Parias. Their bodies have adapted well to being arboreal and better at eating meat. Their hands are clawed with opposable thumbs, a stronger tail, and sharper premolars. They will eat anything they can find, but often prefer ambushing rodents and birds unfortunate enough not to pay attention to their surroundings. These opossum descendants are also more relentless than their ancestors. Using this behavioral adaptation in tandem with thicker fur and a layer of fat, to pick fights and often deter larger animals away from kills. Coming back down to the ground, another species of small mammal that has adapted to this frigid bioregion is the quilled lemming. The quilled lemming is an especially fluffy descendant of the lemming that, like other mammals of the region, dig burrows. Without the snowy burrows, in the summer these animals rely on their hard, hedgehog-like hair that is a nuisance to large predators. Despite their hardening hairs that make them annoying to eat, it doesn't make it impossible, so these mammals are still frequent prey to elder owls and snow jackals. Going from one of the smallest mammals in the region to the largest, we witness a woolly bison male in his prime. Weighing around 1,350 kilograms and three and a half meters long, a migrating woolly bison herd is no laughing matter. With dense, thick fur, and a chambered nose, these bison are the most cold-hardy herbivores in the whole region. Their large heads and forward-facing horns allow for these mammals to easily dig through snow, but also defend themselves from predators, especially when healthy and fully grown. Few animals are bold or stupid enough to hunt a male such as the one depicted in the image in his prime. Mating seasons in the species starts at the end of summer, with a calf born at the end of winter. The calf gets a whole summer to grow, and often weigh over 200 kilograms when the next winter rolls around. The calf will stay with her mother until she gives birth again, at which she sends the older child away. The rather hilariously named Mocking Behind is a deer descendant that lives more north of this region, but frequently comes down to feed on the foliage down in South Lucindo in the summer. These white-tailed descendants have adapted fast hair growth and gained their name from their rather hairy bottoms. Males and females have large eye spots on their tails and rear end and can often confuse predators. When a predator attacks their tail, the predator often ends up with nothing more than a mouthful of nutrient-poor hair. This deer is also faster and more nimble than their ancestors, allowing them a good chance to run away from predators that see through their natural deception. Another deer descendant that has adapted for this region is the Great Crowned Stag, one of the largest cervids of Prius. Eating grasses, leaves, and the occasional shine shroom, these giant creatures thrive in the lush summers of this region. In the winters, they stick around by having large fat storages on a hump on their back, similar to camels in shape and function. On top of this, their shovel-shaped antlers allow these reindeer descendants to dig through the snow in the dark of winter to find grasses, fungus, and other plant material that gets most of them through the darkness. They live in massive herds dozens strong, being groups of harems of one to two males with every six to seven females. Males have larger antlers and will often defend their mates when attacked, sometimes leading to their own death in the process. Whilst not as imposing as the great crowned stag, these deer have a unique friend in the shadows. 
The spotted pronghorn is smaller and less dangerous than the crowned stag. It has smaller permanent horns instead of antlers that regrow yearly. Despite this, they often find themselves in the herds of these massive deer. Why is this? Well, this is an excellent case of niche partitioning. Two species that fill the same niche in an environment will compete with each other, and this usually ends in one species outcompeting the other into extinction. However, when the species specialize in doing different niches in an environment, both groups can live in harmony. The crowned stag and the spotted pronghorns are great examples of this. The spotted pronghorn are faster, more gracile, and have better senses. The crowned stag are slower, larger, and have more impressive weaponry. Due to their unique strategies for survival, these mammals are able to survive in the same environment without one outcompeting the other. However, this has taken a step further in these two species, as their abilities are complementary when combined. Spotted pronghorns have better senses, and crowned stags have bulk and can dig better in winter. Because of this, many herds have both species coexisting together, with pronghorns being like scouts, warning a herd of a nearby predator. And predators are abundant in this region. The hellbite boar is an unexpected predator, especially for those who do not know what pigs are capable of. The descendant of feral hogs, these more carnivorous sewids resemble the extinct hell pig, although that is not particularly a pig, but that's a story for another time. Weighing a whopping 200 kilograms with a large head, their jaws are incredibly muscular. This allows them to make a dangerous bite that will make them a nightmare to encounter especially when angry. Given their longer legs, they will chase prey when they think they got a chance, and sometimes will take down pronghorn or inexperienced snow jackals when given a chance. Females and males alike are both territorial, with females larger and more aggressive than males. She will chase away males that she deems unsuitable in the breeding season, but will often mate with multiple males, resulting in her litters of hoglets often having multiple fathers. This allows her to gain maximum genetic diversity in her young. Speaking of snow jackals, these canids are the only one of their ancestral family to colonize the cold lands. Despite their large size and pack hunting nature, these are not wolves. They are actually the descendants of foxes, as wolves and coyotes never happen to come down south to hunt, instead staying further up north, where many prey of theirs resided. They have evolved longer legs, with wide paws that make traction on any environment easy, especially snow in the winter. They have smaller ears to prevent frostbite, so many rely on sight and smell to find potential prey. Their fur, instead of being a magnificent orange like their ancestors, has become slightly muted in coloration for better camouflage. Weighing 50 to 60 kilograms, they on their own might not be much, but a pack of five to seven of them can be a very intimidating force. Their long snouts, sharp canines, and premolars also help to make them very threatening predators, especially for the pronghorns and the great crowned stags. However, even these intimidating carnivores fear something else. Weighing 700 kilograms and standing over three meters tall when on their hind legs, the bone break bear is truly an animal feared by all. The descendant of a hybrid bear, these monstrous animals have a combined set of traits from their grizzly and polar bear ancestors. Like grizzlies are known to do in some parts of the world, these bears will go into rivers to catch salmon before they spawn. They take things a step further by going into the water and catching large gobies or eels when salmon aren't spawning. They retain the ancestral hypercarnivory of their polar bear ancestors eating very little plant material. Their fur is mostly an off-white color, interrupted by brown splotches on the face and extremities, both a unique set of stripes on the main part of the body. This breaks up their outline, especially in the stands of aspen trees, as they often stay in the forests waiting for prey to come along. They prefer ambush tactics, but will rush down a herd of deer, or even woolly bison if separated from their herd. Whenever they can, they will push snow jackals off of their kills, which never goes well for the jackals, as the bear can often outweigh the entire pack combined. 
These bears will primarily dispatch their prey using their jaws, in a similar fashion to the hellbite pig, but take things a step further. Their bite force is strong enough to shatter bone, and they use this for both hunting live prey and scavenging. This is unlike their snow jackal neighbors, which hunt by using their sharp teeth to cause blood loss in their prey. These bears, however, are always solitary. They will only tolerate another bear in their territory if it is the mate, and their territories are often massive. The variety of species covered in this video are most of the diversity of life found in this region, as not much else is adapted for the coldest place on the continent. However, these aren't the only animals that have evolved from the life abandoned by humanity 5 million years ago on this planet. In the next episode, we will travel northward to the Lucinden High Steppe and examine how animals have adapted to live in an isolated cold desert on an ancient mountain range. At every level, the planet of Nakare 1011C has seen many Earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment light years away from Earth. In just 5 million years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and this series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Pariahs. Last episode, we examined the brisk lands of southern Lucindo, a land racked with seasonal extremes and occasional snowfall on an otherwise heating planet, as well as the life forms that have adapted to thrive in this region. In this episode, however, we travel northward towards an ancient, eroding mountain range. The Lucindan High Plateaus are all that remains of our gargantuan mountain range that existed during the early ages of pre-human Parian history eroding to water in the great sands of unyielding time. To the north of these highlands is the great woodlands of central Lucindo, a dense forest dominated by large trees and diverse wildlife. To the west, the waterlogged and swampy wetlands of southwest Lucindo touch the foothills. And in the south, the animals of south Lucindo depicted in the previous episode reside in this location. Being the last vestiges of a more ancient land formation, this elevated highland juts out hundreds of meters around the foothills that surround it. This great and tall plateau of Lucindo are flat compared to the other highlands and mountains on the rest of the planet, but the many sheer cliffs of hard bedrock make conditions for plant growth difficult, and animal colonization even more so. Despite the challenges behind settling in such a difficult, high, dry land, life found a way to make do with what they were given. The high Lucindan plateaus are surrounded by foothills, with climatic conditions not dissimilar to the boreal forests from the south. Because of this, animals that have adapted to the more harsh conditions may have advantage over other species trying to do the same. The humble quilled lemming has some members of its species that persist in the foothills of the highlands. Herds of great crowned stag and spotted pronghorn may find themselves this far north in the winter to escape the harsh cold, feeding on the bounty of grasses and mosses in the foothills of the loosened and high plateaus. Another herbivore, the great zimu, often fly to these regions to feed on the grasses that thrive doing better here than they do in the thicker woodlands that they spend their summers in. However, these herbivores bring the predators of their homelands to follow them in the seasonal variation, such as the elder owls and snow jackals. These predators do well here in the winters, using the lengthened nighttime for tactically ambushing prey. This menagerie of animals, depicted in more detail in last episode, do well here are not the only animals who have made a niche for themselves in the foothills of the plateaus. One species that is quite successful in the foothills are the small yet hardy frost toads, descendants of the American toads that can be found here 
and in many other places across central and southern Lucindo. Frost toads have become a very successful group of amphibians, and have become this way due to their adaptations that give them an advantage over other frogs and toads in surviving in these new, turbulent lands. Their primary weapon for defense is their poison, having a toxin that makes them extremely unpalatable. When a frost toad reaches maturity, next to nothing wants to actually eat them. However, when they are young, they can be vulnerable to predation, as they lack the quantity of poison that gives the adults their punch. The other adaptation they have acquired for surviving in the temperature climates of Lucindo is their ability to go into a torpor through the harsh of winter, only waking back up when the temperature warms up and food becomes more abundant. These adaptations have led them to being massively successful, but has come with some unique and unexpected perks. Some populations of these frogs are known for hibernating in mammal burrows, taking advantage of another's hard work. Whilst for some frost toads they give nothing back to the host, others will clean their fluffy roommate, ridding them of external parasites as a final snack before entering hibernation. The mole crayfish is a bizarre arthropod, being found nowhere else on Parias. Migrating from waterways in the west, these crayfish descendants have made some novel changes to become less bound to the water, becoming a more terrestrial organism. The mole crayfish is known for digging complicated tunnel systems many times longer than their own body lengths. This provides protection from the outside world, but moisture from deep within the tunnel system ensures the nest is moist and suitable for the organism to survive. They feed on decaying material, roots, and any small invertebrates unfortunate enough to cross their paths. Their nests can often come into contact through explorative tunnels, but confrontations between members of the same species is rare. They mate when a heavy storm comes around, and the males rush above the surface, finding female tunnel systems to mate with the resident. This can be risky business for the male, but few predators go hunting in such a storm. All of these animals have partial control over these lands, but indeed share them with the flora, fauna, and fungi of the highlands up above. The plant life here has evolved a unique array of survival strategies to surviving the poor soil conditions and drier climate of the region. The Lucindan common moss, the most basal of plants in the region, sprawls in the foothills wherever moisture is found, but does not do well in the high plateaus, given the drier conditions up in the highlands. A small and rather irritating plant that can be found all over the plateaus and foothills alike is the amusingly named crabby grass, a crabgrass descendant that has evolved a rather prickly means of reproduction. Their small size and smaller requirements for water make them pre-adapted for a lifestyle here, but have one more feature that makes them more irritating. They have evolved to produce less seeds per tilling, but the seeds are covered in a thick outer shell that resembles a hooked spike. If an animal comes into contact with its seed pod, they will get the seeds stuck to their bodies and will painfully walk elsewhere to disperse it. Another small plant has adapted for seed dispersal by slightly less barbaric means. The fireberry is a capsicum descendant that has retained the intense heat bred into them by the long gone human gardeners of yore. The plant as a whole is a small, thin leafed bush that is often avoided by mammals but a great food source for forgivers birds. Birds lack the taste receptors that detect heat, something that many mammals do. Because of this, the fireberry can ensure that it is only dispersed through birds and spread further than a mammal can naturally disperse seeds through their digestive tract. Another species that grows relatively tall is the highland grass, growing almost exclusively in the canyons of rivers and ephemeral water bodies in the region. Growing over two meters tall, these thickets and stands of tall grass provide great protection for small mammals and insects. They reproduce by wind dispersal, as winds are common on such tall flatlands with no barriers in the way. Less exclusive than the fireberry, the cliff pawpaw is a short, 
a stout tree that thrives in the highlands and has more recently started to spread northward. The banana shaped fruit are filled to the brim with grape shot like seeds and is a staple food item for many animals in the region. The fruits are often sought after by small mammals, often burying seeds and occasionally forgetting where they buried them. Given the decreased dedication to growing tall and the increased evolutionary pressure to produce more fruits, they have become vastly successful and have settled in new environments northwards of the highlands. On the other end of the scale, the largest and most dominant tree species in the area is not a flowering angiosperm, but a pinophyte. The steppe spruce is a large pine tree descendant that grows slowly over the vast highlands, often found in stands of trees by small creeks and rivers. Their spindly, needle-like leaves and sharp pines make them unpalatable for most animals, leaving them alone to grow tall. The many bird species that call these lands home will often nest and rest in these trees, as the steppe spruce are a great vantage point over the flat, dry lands of the plateaus. However, not every tree has adapted to grow tall in these lands. A strange, tough, and shrubbish looking tree can be found in plentiful amounts across the highest points of the plateaus, and strangely enough in other mountain lands. The creeping pine is a rather strange bristlecone pine descendant that does well in highlands such as the Lucindan Plateaus. A couple of meters tall when fully grown, and capable for living for thousands of years, their tangled messes of stems and branches are the ideal hiding and feeding location for migratory birds who nest in them. Some of these birds will eat the cones offered by the creeping pine and disperse them elsewhere. This has allowed these plants to be dispersed hundreds of kilometers away from their homeland, becoming native in the central Lucindan Mountains and even the Bell Creek Western Peaks. The most specialized plant that persists in the flatlands and foothills alike is the small flowering bush of the fall rose. Fall rose plants spread wide and not tall, with spiky branches that eventually become too heavy and dry out as they are replaced by younger branches. These old branches become an extra layer of protection from herbivores, as the ground around the plant becomes too spiky for any large animal to consider this plant worth the risk. These plants have long roots that make searching for water easy. However, what makes this genera of rose descendant unique is their fat flower structures, so large in comparison to the branch that it resides on that it causes the branch to sink to the ground, despite the lower gravity of pariahs. Why do these plants have such thick flowers, and what purpose do they serve? The answers lie in a small bat descendant that roots in them. The fall rose provides housing for rosy cupid's bats to roost in during the day, and the cupid's bat eats any insects that infest the plant and exclusively pollinate this species alone. The cupid's bat has evolved this unique lifestyle through eating the rose's original pollinators, getting pollen on them often. As these bats ate the insects, they accidentally completed pollination in the process. Bats that hung around these roses got the evolutionary advantage over bats in the region, having a safe space to reside in during the day. Eventually, an evolutionary pressure selected for rose bushes and bats that have become more and more dependent on each other, to the point where the bright red furred bats stick out like a sore thumb during the day without their fall rose hosts, and the fall rose is exclusively pollinated by the cupid's bat. The cupid's bat has evolved red fur, a long tongue for seeking nectar and insects, and more intelligence. These bats form monogamous pairs and mate for life, hunting together each night and roosting in the same bush during the day. These plants have all adapted well to the region, further halting the erosion of the plateaus and maintaining a new ecosystem. All of these diverse species of plants fill the bottom of the food chain, providing a base for the heterotrophic organisms to feast. Another key chain in the ecosystem of the Lucindan High Plateaus is the fungal life. 
The common shine shroom and snakeskin fungus, featured in the previous episode, have adapted to the harsh conditions, doing well in the damp crevices carved into the ancient rock. Their adaptability and lack of competition make them well suited for taking on the advantages of becoming established in new locations across the southern half of Lucindo. However, they aren't the only fungi to represent their kingdom in the highlands. One species has adapted to the harsh conditions of the high steppe by becoming parasitic, latching onto other organisms for their own self-gain. The Lucindan siphoner is a shiitake descendant that has adapted a purely parasitic lifestyle, growing out from the host plant and sucking away nutrients out of them in the process. The vast majority of spores and young mycelium die off in the process of an attempted host infection, but chances are one spore will parasitize successfully and keep the generations going. Being non-toxic, they are often eaten or touched by herbivores coming from plant to plant, helping in the spread of the next generation of parasites. Another fungus capitalizes off of a different source instead of the nutrients of living plants. The morbid mushroom is a common sight to see in the region, especially around dead bodies of animals or plants. The young members of the species have long strands of mycelium that make them good symbionts for local plants but these organisms lie in wait until they detect the chemicals of decay. When the morbid mushroom detects a dead body, they will grow underground towards it and produce fruiting bodies, or mushrooms, to complete their life cycle. They use nutrients from the decaying plant or animal material to produce more fruiting bodies. The spores of these fungi are covered in a sticky substance that can easily stick to a passing animal, and whilst the fruiting body has a sticky scent, it is perfectly edible. In fact, many scavengers will eat the smelly mushrooms, getting sticky black spores all over their faces in the process. When the animal wipes the spores off in a new location, many of the spores will have a good chance to start the next generation and lie in wait once more. These fungi form a unique role in the ecosystem, being key in plant growth and clearing away dead organisms. They, however, are not the only heterotrophic creatures that call these lands home. The world of arthropods have a unique barrage of organisms that have adapted well to the region, as the many opportunities for niches are there for the small insects to claim for themselves. One of these arthropods is the big-headed grass louse. The big-headed grass louse thrives in the highlands and other regions of the western continent of Lucindo, and have carved a niche for themselves as a small, adaptive, and omnivorous insect. Their larger heads and stronger mandibles allow them to eat more resources than their ancestors, and their varied diets making them able to exploit more environments and reproduce more frequently. Being small and reproducing rapidly, sheer numbers alone allow these small arthropods to thrive. However, Many grass louse struggle in places where high levels of competition are, especially from a beetle descendant that may be bound to take their place. The snipper beetle is an arthropod descended from the golden stag beetle that has adapted a more herbivorous style of living. With a pair of cutting, scissor-like pincers, they eat plant material exclusively when they reach adulthood, preferring grasses as their favorite snack. Their more aerodynamic bodies and wings make them slightly better at flying than their ancestors, which has allowed them to spread across the continent wherever food is plentiful. The main strategy for survival against large predators, if their heavy armor does not work, is reproducing in high numbers, as the autumns of this continent are filled with swarms of these beetle descendants, which will reproduce as much as they can and leave hundreds of eggs and larvae across the land before they die. The Necessary Evil is a biting midge descendant that exists as the pollinator specialist for the cliff pawpaw. The young of this species spend this vulnerable part of their lives underwater, having few predators to eat them. When the larvae emerge as adults a lunar cycle after being born, the males seek pollen from cliff pawpaw trees and the females search for host animals to suck blood from. 
The males get the nutrients needed for reproduction from gathering nectar from their favorite tree species, but the females will create small holes in their hosts to siphon the blood from, sometimes spreading disease in the process. The satiated males and females will go and spawn in another body of water, repeating the vicious cycle all over again. Despite the gross and parasitic cycle of these insects, the birds and mammals of the region must tolerate their presence, as they are essential pollinators for one of the major plants in the region. Another midge descendant also calls this region home. They and the necessary evil have taken advantage of the parasitic niches left behind by the lack of mosquitoes bought on the planet. The copper midge has also adapted to parasitize other animals in their adult stage. However, something that makes them unique is their larval morphs. There are two different groups of larvae that become that way due to chemicals in the local environment which take a long time to become pupa in adults. They do best in places where earthworms don't thrive well, as the larvae are long and resemble worms in many ways besides their chitinous mouthparts. They are also coated in spikes, allowing them more protection that their fat bodies would otherwise lack. Adult copper midges will fly far from their starting points, which has led to this extreme lineage of insects to thrive almost globally during this time period. These midges and beetles and louses are not the only insects that exist here, as others have adapted to be the predators of the insect world. The Highland Streamhawk is one of those organisms. Described partially in the last episode, these dragonfly descendants do best here, thriving in the long summers of this part of the world. Their young infest the waterways of the Lucinden High Plateaus, being efficient predators of small fish and other insects unfortunate enough to get into the water. They spend the majority of their time in the water as their nymph stage. However, the adults are the apex predators of the skies, using their efficient wings to catch prey and dodge predators. The Sacrifice Running Spider, a descendant of Jumping Spider and a close cousin with the Lucinden Fur Spider down south, is a uniquely adapted spider that has retained the large size that the fur spider lineage has adopted. During most of their lives, these spiders are cursorial predators. However, to cope with the length of the winters of the region, these spiders have adapted a grim way of survival for the next generation. The species is sexually dimorphic, with males significantly smaller than females. When mating season comes in the autumn, males will fatten up and find a female. The female will eat the male after mating, his nutritious body being what she needs to sustain her eggs. She will dig a nest 5 centimeters in diameter and filled with leaves and other insulating parts. During the winter she lays her cocoon of eggs in this safe and warm chamber and she enters a sleep she does not wake up from. When spring arrives, the spiderlings will emerge from the cocoon and have a first meal, which may or may not be their own mother. This is a rather gruesome cycle, but it allows these baby spiders better chances to survive in the wild, causing a lifestyle such as this to be evolutionarily viable. The sunbeam ants, despite their small individual sizes, are the most impressive arthropods in the whole highlands. The descendants of black carpenter ants, these animals adapted to be less picky in property choice. Nesting in dead trees or in subterranean holes, Colonies of these arthropods are usually scavengers, but will regularly work together to actively hunt other insects. However, this violent behavior is rare in between members of the same species, even when foreign colonies come into contact with each other. This is due to their yellow hairs on their back, which they are capable of ejecting when needed. These hairs can irritate other ants, encouraging colonies to stay away from one another and not engage lethally. Due to this, the sunbeam's high genetic diversity allowed them to dominate other ant species in the area into extinction, becoming the only genus of ants in the highlands. All of these arthropods form a complicated set of chains on the food web, being predators for some species and eaten by others. However, the animals on top of this food chain are the chordates, 
mostly the birds and mammals in this region specifically. A bizarre group of chordates that got to these highlands is the blanket flower streamer tail trout. Swimming up a set of rapids on the western side of the highlands, these fish became the sole inheritors of the limited waterways in the highlands. Being the only fish in the rivers and lakes of the highlands, they are the apex predators of the waters, eating crayfish, insect nymphs, and even small birds. They are not that long, around a meter at most, but make up for that with unique colorations. Males have lengthened bits of flesh on their tails that look like streamers, and are brightly colored to attract a mate. When a male has attracted a mate, the group will spawn upriver before returning to their home waters. This can be a risky business for the males, as their brighter colors make them more easily spotted from above than a female would be. Unfortunately, just like in southern Lucindo, reptiles and amphibians have not adapted well to this region, giving way to be dominated by the birds and mammals. An exception exists for the frost toad, doing well in the highlands and the foothills alike. However, unlike southern Lucindo, the scale bows in the side of the birds, as their flight allowed them to colonize the lands before the mammals could climb upwards and adapt to the conditions of the highlands. The smallest but not the least of the mammals in the region, the arrow-toothed squirrel is an opportunistic omnivore. As this region has stands of trees separated by dozens to hundreds of feet of flat grassland in between them, these squirrels have adapted to be faster on the ground. As they have become better at running on the ground, they are better at pursuing prey. Their thick fur, slightly larger size, and sharp incisors allow them to tackle prey which are sometimes larger than they are. Their sheer determination greatly rewards the high risks when gone well, although often it can end up badly. They will typically mate with multiple partners in one breeding season, maximizing genetic diversity. Juvenile arrow squirrels often act more like their ancestors than their parents do, being more inclined to eating insects and hanging out in trees. The shaggy marmot is a small herbivore that survives the cold, arid conditions by tunneling in large social groups. Their stout bodies and big noses help retain heat, compounded further by the warm tunnels. These marmots will eat more in the autumn before entering hibernation through winter, and marmots in these large social groups are very social. Both males and females have strong, clawed arms that make them great for digging. However, they will rarely use them to attack each other. During socialization events, they will rub each other's heads and keep their bodies low to the ground. Unfortunately, given their small size, these mammals often find themselves at the bottom of the food chain. The Lucindan wandering sheep, a descendant of the bighorn sheep, have adapted to the harsh conditions of the highlands by leaving. During the early spring, these sheep return to the highlands, an easy task given their unexpectedly excellent climbing abilities, and mothers will give birth to lambs. The young will eat and grow fast over the spring and summer months, as their longer and more muscly legs will grow and be ready to run from predators that they can't fight. Males in the species have large horns that can inflict hundreds of pounds of force on impact when charging, which they are inclined to use on predators close to their young just as much as they are to use them on each other. Females in the species also have horns, but are smaller and used for self-defense against smaller predators. Late summer is the breeding season, when males will compete with each other for the right to mate. When the food becomes scarce in autumn and they have eaten their fill, they will migrate northward to warmer lands, coming down the mountains and moving through the central woodlands in herds a few dozen strong. During the warm months when the wandering sheep reside in the highlands, they come into contact with the species that looks quite similar to them. Although this is only a superficial resemblance, and the highland shaghorn are close cousins of the spotted pronghorn that live in the foothills and boreal forests of the south. The highland shaghorn does not migrate away during the winter, opting for thicker fur and a larger body size. Their large size gives them multiple advantages, 
but they have given up the high speeds of their ancestors in the process. Being over a meter and a half tall at the shoulder and weighing 700 kilograms, an adult male and his species has next nothing to fear, especially with the weaponry on their heads. Walking slowly and carefully across the dry highlands, they eat sprouts, mosses, and some grasses, but their favorite meal is the cliff pawpaw. Given the unique landscape of this region, one species has adapted to use their natural armor and take advantage of the land. The big-nosed Rollum are the descendants of nine-banded armadillo that is small and omnivorous. They tend to eat grasses but will also eat fruit, insects, and fungi. Their sharper hooves allow them to be great climbers, but the key to their survival and pain both come from their armor. Their extremely thick armor and strong bones make them excellent at surviving falls from tall heights, rolling down hills and cliffs to escape predators. This strategy is very successful, as few predators can either break their armor or be willing to throw themselves down cliffs to catch prey. Rollums are social and live in a slide, or small group, composed of a few monogamous pairs. The lower gravity of the planet of Piraeus also lessens the damage of falling, but eventually dents, fractures, and scratches will appear in the armor, and rolling can sometimes lead to one's death. When they roll, they can often become separated and slides will often exchange members on accident. This raccoon descendant, the false bandit bear, is a creature that often causes Rollums to roll away in fear. These organisms have repurposed their arboreal habits for being better rock climbers, and their thicker forelimbs make them great at grappling prey. Another key adaptation for their predatory lifestyle is their thicker jaws and teeth, allowing them to be more carnivorous. They are smart, like their ancestors, and will employ multiple strategies to take down prey by working together. The species consists of many fission-fusion societies, with groups often being represented by one sex. Using pack tactics, an ambush from the species can be a threat to any animal in the region, even the large highland shaghorn. These animals are also semi-fossorial, but frequently abandon their large burrows that become shelter for other small creatures. False bandit bears regularly hang out with frost toads, allowing them to reside in their burrows and clean them in exchange. However, the true king of the highlands is not a false bear, but a true one. The golden highland bear is a massive, long-living mammal that is capable of eating almost any resource in the region, plant, or animal. With large feet, long claws, and golden yellow fur, these bears look very different from their ancestors. The Golden Highland Bear is the largest animal atop the flat peaks, with males weighing up to 800 kilograms. These brown bear descendants are omnivorous, eating everything from fruits, to moss, to fish, to living and dead animals. They are capable of consuming most things, even lots of low-nutrition plants, via their long and complicated digestive tract that is capable of digesting more food types than their ancestors. With a voracious appetite, they are very territorial and tend not to tolerate the presence of other bears outside the mating season. Whilst the mammals have taken many unique niches and are doing quite well atop the highlands of Lucindo, they are not as diverse as the great number of birds in the region. This part of the world is an excellent location for birds to nest, having few predators outside of a bold squirrel or false bandit bear, and the bounty of nutrients from the plants and insects in the region allow a safe space for hatchlings to grow. Many birds migrate here to breed and nest, one of which is the small redcap, a songbird descendant that mainly lives in the great woodlands of central Lucindo, but will come up to the highland in the spring to build communal nests. The communal nests are defended aggressively and will often end some adults trying to defend their young. They eat insects but will also eat fruits and seeds when given the opportunity to do so, but will travel back up north in the winter to keep warm. 
The mountain crake is another bird that migrates from up north in the summer months for opportunities for more food. These birds hang around water bodies in the region, building nests atop shallow water in communal groups. These vast communal nests are appetizing for other animals to consume, but many eggs and nests make it through by sheer numbers. Having thick feather coating to protect them from the elements, they do well in this climate. However, when autumn comes around, the young birds that successfully made it past the vulnerable stage of their lives will fly with their parents to northern lands to escape the harsher winter climates and to gain access to more food. They eat mostly vegetation and are quite large and stocky for flying birds, which can leave them vulnerable to predators when they are not paying attention to their environment. Yet another migratory bird that comes in from the forests up north is the blue-headed pigeon, a descendant of the resurrected species of passenger pigeon brought back by humans before leaving Piraeus. Despite being brought back as a resurrected species, their descendants have adapted to the conditions of the forests and highlands alike, and doing so has caused them to barely resemble their resurrected ancestors. Through most of the year, a single pair of monogamous pigeons hang together, eating berries and insects primarily. When the time is right, hundreds of blue-headed pigeons make the journey up to the steppe of the highlands to nest. Many nests consist of two sets of parents who raise their small clutches in a single nest. A larger migrant that lives in the area is, of all things, a seabird. The sawbill gull is a bird that lives along the coast for most of the year, but come to the highlands to nest in late winter to early spring. Loose groups of sawbill gulls nest together, returning to the same site they were hatched in every year, raising chicks together. They eat fish, meat from small birds and mammals, and insects. The species breed with almost every member of their rookery, or group, so that the chicks have maximum genetic diversity and males will defend any hatchling in the group, as any of them could be potentially theirs. Members of the species can live for over 50 years, and elders with more experience will often help younger parents raise chicks of their own. This species also exhibits a surprising amount of homosexual behavior, but the ultimate reason behind this is unknown. The last of the diverse array of nesting birds in the region is a corvid descendant. The golden-tailed raven exists across most of the southern end of Lucindo, but prefers to nest in the highlands. They have not changed too much from their ancestors outside of their coloring, opting for more iridescent feathers and a beautiful array of yellow feathers that give them their name. They eat mostly meat, especially small mammals and birds, but a social murder of these golden-tailed ravens can ravage colonies of other nesting groups. A murder of golden-tailed ravens consists of three to five monogamous pairs and their young. Their intelligence has allowed them to adopt new strategies for survival, such as working together to distract other birds whilst their partner steals an egg or two. These ravens are larger and live longer than their ancestors, and their increased lifespan gives elder individuals more wisdom that they can use to help other members of the murder survive. Now these birds all migrate to this location to nest, many of which do in colonies, but they are not the only birds that live here. Other birds choose to stay throughout the year, not leaving when the conditions of the highlands get difficult in the dark of winter. One of these birds is the small and humble yellow-breasted chickadee. Their small size and seed-eating habits make them vulnerable against predators. Thankfully, in the spring, they hide their nests in groups in a hollow tree. But when summer arrives, they often nest with the redcaps that migrate to communally nest. The yellow-breasted chickadee eats mainly insects and seeds, so they don't go into competition with the larger red birds, and they profit off of the redcaps' higher levels of aggression to larger nest raiders. This double nesting strategy ensures a large amount of chickadees make you through the summer, and their small appetites make food not too challenging to access in the winter. Another bird that relies less on the smaller tree cover is the running grouse, a spruce grouse descendant that has evolved a chicken-like body plan 
that gives them poorer flying skills but increased cursorial abilities. The longer and stronger legs of these birds allow them to run from ground predators into abandoned false banded bear burrows or other ground positions. They primarily eat vegetation and this poor source of nutrients further make these birds poor flyers. A close cousin of the running grouse is another grouse descendant who has retained more arboreal-like behaviors like their ancestors, and thus are still pretty decent flyers. The convict grouse is an amusingly named grouse descendant that has a checker-like pattern that makes their outline confusing for most predators. They feed primarily on insects and seeds, especially grass seeds. However, they opt to nest on the high cliffs, and few predators are willing to attack such a well-defended position. These birds will fly to the foothills below in the summer and fly up to the highlands in the winter. The cliff pawpaw is also a stable food supply for this veggie-eating bird, eating and dispersing seeds throughout the cold months whilst most other birds have already left. The last and most specialized bird for sticking around in the winter is the Heisenberg vulture, a bird that has gone through radical changes to survive the arid highland conditions. They have evolved thicker skin around the head to endure the cold better, and the feathers that they still retain are thick and efficient to survive in the colder environments of the highlands. Given how flat the tops of the plateaus are, and how quickly fresh carcasses vanish in an environment like this, these condor descendants have adapted a more aggressive lifestyle. Although this bird is still able to fly, they spend more time on the ground in pursuing prey. Their cursorial running abilities and pronged beaks make them look like the ancient dromaeosaurs they descended from. Their large claws and muscular legs make great gripping weapons, which they use to pin prey before killing them with their beaks. Despite this bald, despite these bald, aggressive running birds' appearance, they mate for life. They form a monogamous bond and raise a single egg per clutch. Their high case selection features make them the longest living birds on South Lucindo, capable of living for over 80 Parian years. They also have unique hunting strategies, using gravity to kill prey too large for them to take down on their own. If they can push prey off of cliffs, this usually results in their death and a quick, easy meal. However, they still will scavenge when given the chance, eating prey too putrid for other animals to consume. They nest in small caves on cliff sides, with some Heisenberg vultures coming back to even visit their parents' nest. All of these animals, plants, and fungi represent the majority of the life adapted to live in the highlands of southern Lucindo. However, even this arid and frequently cold flat mountains are not the most extreme environment on the continent. Traveling past the temperate woodlands and semi-tropical swamps further north, one will inevitably counter the central Lucindan Desert, a rain shadow located on the northern side of the continent, with a depleting mountain range blocking waters coming from the east. The next episode will describe the few animals that have adapted for the harshest and hottest environment on the entire continent. At every level, the planet of Nakare 1011C has seen many Earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment light years away from Earth. In just 5 million years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and this series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Parias. The last episode, we examined the flat highland plateaus of South Lucindo, examining the diversity of life in one of the toughest environments on the continent. 
And whilst this region of the world has some extreme conditions that need to be overcome in order to survive and thrive, it is not the most extreme environment on the western landmass. In this episode, we will examine the massive expanse that is the western Crimson Desert, a region that takes up a fifth of the continent and is incredibly low in water supply. This region has nearly no annual precipitation, with year-long intense heat throughout the day and cold conditions after nightfall. The region receives the name the Crimson Desert due to the reddish sands, which are colored this way due to the higher levels of iron located within the sand particles, possibly a holdout from human colonies long since abandoned. Not only is this region hot, arid, and low on water, but it is relatively isolated from the rest of Lucindo. To the south of the western Lucindan Desert is a small band of grassland that quickly gives way to the Great Central Forest, a starkly different landscape with not much of a transitionary zone in between it and the desert north. To the west are the cold currents of the western global ocean, not typically helping in bringing in extra moisture to the region. To the north is a small choke point that leads into the northern savannas, with most of the biota here having similarities with organisms from this part of the world. To the east are the spinal mountains, blocking not only the rains, but many ground-based organisms from reaching this part of the world in the first place. Paradoxically, despite the lack of resources and harsh conditions, the Crimson Desert has plenty of native species that call this part of the planet their home. Many organisms that specialized here have niches all to themselves, but are not usually found anywhere else in the world. On top of that, the coastal side of the Crimson Desert still has a modest covering of plant species due to the heavy levels of fog and moisture. This relatively dense amount of fog and moisture doesn't travel far inland, but is perfect for plants specialized enough to withstand the heat. Some species here in the Crimson Desert are already pre-adapted for such a hot and arid climate, and thus have a larger range around the entire continent. The first species of plants to colonize this region are the descendants of cactuses, who have spent a lot of time on Earth specializing in arid environments, and are perfect for taking this region's lack of competition to their full advantage. There are two groups of cacti in the region, which have specialized for different niches to avoid mutual competition. The first of the two is the giant Lucindan tree cactus, a species of cactus that has taken advantage of the lower gravity of Parias to grow up to 7 meters tall, with segments of the cactus body becoming more wooden over the many years that a single cactus can live. This species can reproduce both sexually and asexually, allowing this cactus to become the most dominant plant species in the entire bioregion. A close second comes in their close relative, who has taken an extremely different evolutionary path to success. The barrel pear cactus is much smaller, and doesn't grow like the larger tree cactus, yet it grows in great numbers across the desert. Their root system is spread quite far away from the main body, potentially over a dozen meters underground throughout the sand in order to find any kind of moisture. It also contains a thicker body filled with any excess water that it gathers, a good chunk of it being underground to prevent access from consumers. Another common species to find in the region is the bloodfruit tree the descendant of a species of pomegranate already pre-adapted to thrive in a place with high heat and low humidity. This tree can be up to 3 meters tall and has a unique fruit that makes a distinct part of the environment in a key way. The pomegranate fruit have become tear-shaped and remain tightly bound to the parent plant, only flung away during strong winds or from animal activity. The bottom of the teardrop is more vulnerable than the rest of the fruit, where insects and birds can easily break through and eat the seeds. 
When the small football-sized fruits are hollowed out, they can become breeding grounds for small species of birds and insects. The most humble species of plant in the region that can be found quite often around ephemeral water bodies and along the coastline is the spine grass. Spine grass is a common goosegrass descendant that has evolved to exist in the arid crimson desert. The species has evolved thin, slow-growing blades of grass that can be sharp when stepped on and minimize water loss. Whilst not stopping consumers from eating the grass, the sharp nature and efficient water usage has allowed this species to proliferate across the Red Desert. One of the more specialized plants that exist in the Crimson Desert is the much harder to find False King Palm. The False King Palm is, despite their tree-like shape, actually a grass descendant. This crabgrass descendant evolved similarly to the spine grass, but evolved a much different life history during the process. The leaves have become more needle-like and hard to consume, just like the spine grass, especially when fully grown. On top of that, however, the plant has evolved a wood-like stem that raises the plant above its competition. The plant reproduces using primary wind dispersal, so the number of these plants in the region is relatively low. The main flowering plant that can be found on the western coasts is the Fire of the West. This fiery coastus descendant has evolved to specifically utilize the mist and small amounts of precipitation from the western coast of the desert to stay hydrated throughout the harsh conditions. They also time the opening and closing of stomata, or the microscopic holes that plants use to absorb sunlight and give out waste products, to open and close specifically around sunrise and sunset to maximize absorption and minimize water loss. Due to this adaptation that they have evolved, they are the most common flower that can be found along the coasts, lighting up the reddish sand with their orange petals. A small plant that can be found in the oases of the desert is the crimson sabal, a low-lying plant with bright red berries. The berries are often swallowed whole by toads and dispersed to other parts of the desert. Whilst these plants have evolved to take advantage of vacant niches in the desert, they provided other opportunities for unique clades of fungi and animals to approach the environment and become new species in the process. Due to the harsh conditions of the region and lack of species predisposed to evolving in such a dry desert climate, fungal life in the region is not diverse at all. However, there are two clades of fungus that have evolved to take this niche. The Golden Desert Fungus is the first of two specialized fungi species that have adapted for life in the Crimson Desert. This fly agaric descendant has adapted to spend the majority of its life underground as a symbiotic species with the plant life in the region, sprouting from the ground only when the key needs are met. This species has evolved to be less toxic, so more species are inclined to get close to the fungus and touch the spores potentially spreading the spores further in the process. The other and more parasitic fungus is the beetle-targeting white dread. The white dread is a honey fungus descendant that has become overspread across northern and western Lucindo. Whilst most of the white dread's life cycle occurs underground in a symbiotic nature with the local plants nearby, much like the golden desert fungus, but the key difference comes in at their last stage. When they reach maturity, they will sprout fruiting bodies that are extremely packed with toxic spores that specifically target a single beetle species. When a beetle gets infected with the spores of the white dread, the beetle loses control over itself and becomes a slave to the fungus. The beetle ignores all instincts for self-preservation and will search for the best spot for the fungus to grow. When or if it finds the spot, it will die there and be the first source of nutrition for the next cycle of fungal life. The fungi and plants have evolved to become experts at survival in the harsh, dry, crimson desert, but are not the only life forms found in this region of the world. 
A multitude of animal species have evolved extremely unique, niche lifestyles to exist in the Crimson Desert, with a variety of different adaptations to enter new niches for a new lifestyle. The strangest of life forms that crawls across the Crimson Desert is the Desert Sledge, a slug descendant that has some rather interesting adaptations that allow them to survive in the desert. The Desert Sledge has evolved a hard covering on their backs that resembles bird droppings, which helps in aiding protection from predators and from the heat of the suns. To keep their mostly moist bodies slick, they consume cactus and utilize a special kind of saliva that slows the repair process for the cactus and thus is easier to consume. Desert sledges only mate when the rains come, so their lifespans are typically a few years long so they can live in between rare storms and have a chance to mate at least once. The desert sledge is not the only invertebrate to call this part of the planet their home. There is a small assortment of arthropods that also call the Crimson Desert their territory. One such invertebrate is an arthropod known as the Spiny Runner. This spindly and spiny beetle species can be found across the desert, patrolling the sands during dawn and dusk in the pursuit of soft-bodied prey like insect larvae or sledges. Their legs are extremely long in comparison to the rest of their body to keep the hot sand from touching the rest of them. Another arthropod descendant that has evolved to live in the region is the purple moon stag beetle. This beetle has a much more specialized lifestyle that requires cacti in order to survive, in comparison to the more generalist spiny runner. When a purple moon stag beetle is born, it feeds exclusively on cactus tissue and will stay in the larval stage longer than usual. An ecological trigger that causes the purple moon beetle to grow up is when a storm comes into the red desert, an event that happens very rarely. When a storm comes in, this causes the larvae to metamorphose into their adult form. Females will travel from cactus to cactus, mating with any males that will defend their cactus flowers to the death. After a few months, the adult beetles die off, but the eggs eventually hatch into their larval form to feed on the cactus and wait for the next storm. The Reaper Butterfly is yet another arthropod species that exists in the region, but has undergone unique evolutionary changes to their larval habits that allow them to thrive here. They can be primarily found along the western coast of the desert, where plants are relatively more abundant. As larvae, they are predatory and will ambush beetles as their primary form of hunting. Their shearing mandibles in the larval caterpillar stage allow them to be very effective hunters when ambushing a beetle in targeting weak points on their armor. When given enough nutrition, the caterpillar will form a cocoon and mature into their adult stage, which they will transition from predators to pollinators. The nurse wasp is a honeybee descendant that has devolved the trait of being eusocial. Due to the harsh conditions of the desert and the small amount of plant cover to pollinate, eusocial pollination colonies are no longer viable. Living solitary lives throughout their whole life cycle, these bees will pollinate from place to place on their own, but will eat other arthropods when given the opportunity. They may also default to the ancestral condition and attack in swarms when food is scarce. Despite some species devolving eusocial characteristics in the desert, another species independently evolved a primitive form of eusociality. The orange new friend is a eusocial beetle species that has a primitive caste system. The queen is the largest in the colony and produces the young. The king is the only male allowed to breed in the colony, with the rest of the young being sterile. When a colony is fully mature, they can control entire massive swaths of the desert, 
and have a near monopoly on any animal carcass that dies in their turf. When an animal dies near an orange new friend colony, any scouts flying around the desert will detect the scent of death and return to the hive and alert the colony that a dead animal is present by emitting pheromones and rubbing other workers. Workers will follow the one who found the dead animal and fly in a massive swarm, up to a hundred strong, and bully any other scavengers that are there until they run off. Colonies along the coast and near the Great Forest can grow to have over 3,000 members, as a mating pair of orange new friends can last over a decade. Whilst the plant, fungal, and invertebrates have found their own ways to live in the desert, they lay a great groundwork for the larger and more charismatic vertebrates. A massive diversity of vertebrates have found hyper-specific niches in the Crimson Desert, and a much higher number of species can be found here than one would typically imagine. The Red Desert is almost empty, but there are still enough resources to allow for growth to occur. Due to the arid conditions, there is only one toad species that calls this vast portion of the western continent home. The exterminator toad is a large species of frog that can weigh over 6 kilograms and has a massive mouth. This species will eat almost anything it can get its big mouth on, from berries to vertebrates to invertebrates. This toad as an adult will often bury itself in loose soil and only emerge either at night to travel or to catch prey if they get too close. Due to the lack of moisture inland, these toads are only found along the coastline of the desert and in the savannas up north, of which we will examine in much more detail in a future episode. Whilst the exterminator toad has representatives in the Crimson Desert region, they aren't the only species that exist elsewhere on the continent as well. The pilgrim elk is a reindeer species that has evolved to cross the desert, especially alongside the coast, in order to migrate to greener pastures in the winter. In the summer months, a pilgrim elk herd will consume low-lying vegetation in the great forest and its swampy western edge. When autumn comes, the antlers grow in both males and females in the herd, and is an instinctual marker to move northward to escape the colder winter. Their flat, velvet-covered antlers offer a great level of heat dispersal when they migrate through the desert, but some may not make it through the hundreds of kilometers of trekking to make it to the northern savannas for the winter months. However, they repeat the walk southward in the spring and drop their antlers on the route back to their southern feeding grounds. The jack horse is another large species that sometimes goes down the coast to feed on grasses and low-lying vegetation. They live in small herds with one to three males per herd. Jack horses have long ears and long legs, both of which help them be efficient at walking and getting rid of excess heat in the desert. They are less aggressive among members of the same species, with males opting to move their ears and vocalize to attract mates. They primarily live in the northern savannas, but will move southward when conditions are especially rough to find food on the desert's coasts. The jack horse and the pilgrim elk's migratory lifestyles encourage their predators to follow them. The running wolf is the apex predator of the region, with large bodies and heavy jaws. They are quite tall but not particularly heavy, but use their larger bodies to be fast pursuit predators. They will chase after a selected target for long distances and are often successful in a hunt as a frightened prey member can be prone to being chased into exhaustion in the dunes of the desert. Because of the lack of resources, packs of the species are very small, typically consisting of a single mating pair and their offspring. The marauder opossum can also be found here, 
but as their range extends to cover most of central Lucindo, they will be examined further in future episodes. Examining species that can be only found in the Crimson Desert and nowhere else in the world, there is a unique example of speciation and niche partitioning. The elf-eared armadillo and the collared armadillo are two closely related species that shared a common ancestral species that was abandoned on Paris five million years ago, that is, the nine-banded armadillo. These two have speciated due to the long distances of the desert, but also eat different kinds of food as well. The collared armadillo is larger and is primarily carnivorous, whilst the elf-eared is smaller and more of a plant eater. These two species eat different kinds of food to avoid competition with each other. If these two species both ate the same resource, they would be competing with the other, resulting in one of them going extinct. Specialization allows for species to have a good niche only they will fill. The long-eared legget is a rabbit descendant that has evolved a different body type to prop up a larger body size that is more efficient over long distances. This change has been in part triggered by the running wolves, so the species of rabbit can run at fast speeds for long distances. The long-eared legget also has massive ears to help disperse heat as quickly as possible. This trait, alongside their more crepuscular behaviors, allow them to thrive in the desert despite a very small amount of food and water. While some species evolve to move over massive distances, others evolve to move less far. The trap mole is a dread for any terrestrial insects in the desert. It camps nearby cactuses and small pit traps to capture prey. Due to their fossorial abilities, they don't spread nearly as far in the region, but are quite successful in hunting their specialized target. They are solitary for most of their lives, mating when they have the chance, but typically keeping their distance. The smallest tetrapod species that exists in the desert is the tiny Lesser Sand Scatter. A very small rodent species that is nocturnal and congregates around places of water, they form the bottom of the food chain and don't have much means for survival outside of sheer numbers. Whilst they are tiny, they are key for the ecosystem by being food for many other animals in the region. A small species that finds itself in the middle of the food chain is the Crimson Monet, a mink descendant that specializes in hunting for nests and burrows. Their tubular shape makes them perfect at invading small nests and burrows, to which they overpower the prey inside and then consume. However, they can often be prey for other animals if caught due to their smaller size. To prevent this, the species has evolved red fur with dark stripes to be harder to spot on the red sand. Another intermediate predator that targets small prey is the white-tipped ear fox. The white-tipped ear fox lives mainly along the coast and is primarily an ambush predator. They have efficient sweat glands that they may lick to minimize water loss. Whilst this keeps themselves clean, it also helps in hiding their tracks from more strong predators. These cleanly foxes are solitary and territorial, only tolerating another of their own species in their territory in order to mate. The birds of this region, in comparison to the mammals, are far less diverse, but they have their own representatives as well. The coastal rusty and orange bugpecker are two sparrow descendants that have speciated into their own independent groups. They are both primarily generalist, eating what they can find, such as seeds and insects, but have different nesting behaviors and sizes that led to their speciation. The coastal rusty is found primarily on the coast, and they nest in hollowed out pomegranates, thus forcing them to be quite small. The orange bugpecker, in comparison, is larger and nests on giant cacti, and are therefore more common across the desert more generally. 
A more global species can be found in this desert, as well as other places across Piraeus, and is known as the Terra Vulture. The Terra Vulture can fly for hundreds of kilometers at a time, and frequently fly to new places to look for food. They primarily eat meat, either by hunting or scavenging, but will sometimes eat high-calorie plant materials like fruits. The males in the species will be the one to guard the nest, whilst females fly farther to mate with multiple males. Males are very aggressive in guarding their territory, especially when they have hatchlings to protect. The hatchlings will stay with the father until they are old enough to fly and eat on their own, to which they will live on their own for the rest of their lives. Another set of species that diverged from a recent evolutionary common ancestor is the snake sandfowl and the great gurkey, both of which are wild turkey descendants. These two clades are quite different from each other. The snake sandfowl eats reptiles for most of their diet, having thick scales on their legs that make snake bites less likely to be deadly. They are the smaller of the two clades, and still have some ability to fly for short distances, despite being quite bulky. They are usually solitary and have quite a harsh temperament, and have a larger range deeper into the interior of the desert. In comparison, the vegetarian Gwerki has become completely flightless, trading flight for a larger body size. Being the tallest animals in the desert, their bipedal running gait allows them to be good at running away from most predators. They live in harems controlled by a single male, which gets replaced by new males that enter the harem when the elder is too old to fight the challenger. These species diverged greatly from each other due to their completely different diet, social structure, and general lifestyle, causing them to be almost unrecognizable from each other. The egg pecker and mottled eagle are both descendants of the bald eagle. They have also diverged from each other to specialize for different niches in the crimson environment. The mottled eagle is more like the ancestral species they descend from. They have large wings, up to 3 meters long, that allow them to soar for hundreds of kilometers in a single flight. They mate for life and eat anything they can catch from carrion to live reptiles, mammals, and other birds. They differ from their ancestors by having more feathers on the legs to protect them from the heat. In comparison, the egg pecker looks chubbier, with smaller wings and a sharper upper beak. They can still fly, but not as much as their relatives do. Only the females in the species care for the young, and these birds hunt primarily by bullying other birds off of nests and targeting eggs. If no nests are found to bother, they will target small reptiles and mammals instead. Whilst the mammals and birds have plenty of representatives on the Crimson Desert, some of the most extreme survivors of the region are the reptiles, one of which is the rocky tortoise a tortoise descendant that has evolved a unique way to disguise themselves. They are nocturnal and feed exclusively on cacti and other tough plant material they can find in the desert, but when the day rolls around, they will dig partially into the ground and expose their backs and backsides to the suns. When growing up, the shell often deforms and becomes asymmetric, looking like a rock in the process. When they dig their faces into the sand, their rear end resembles a rock embedded into the sand, and results in predators usually leaving them alone. Another reptile species that has adapted to the region are the two different rattlesnake species that are present, the cinderfall rattlesnake and the twilight rattlesnake. Both have descended from other rattler species so are more distantly related than some other related clades that can be found in the desert. Both are venomous hunters, but diverge due to their activity. The cinderfall rattlesnake is more active during the day, ambushing small prey and filling them with toxins that lead to their death. When a prey is envenomated, 
They will die quickly due to the toxin, and the snake can track the body up to 10 kilometers away. In comparison, the twilight rattlesnake is a nocturnal species that is larger and will thus target larger prey. They are more common on the coast, while the cinderfall rattlesnakes are found more usually inland. A unique species that can be found alongside the desert's coast has evolved to beat the heat by being semi-aquatic. The marine monitor is a varanid that has evolved to stay in the water for a good portion of their lives. They have long and flat tails that provide propulsion through the water, and their large size in their adult form means that most terrestrial predators will not target them. Two modified air sacs in their throat have evolved to store excess salt from the water, using a special enzyme to attract the salt. When threatened, this monitor will spit salt if a threat gets too close, potentially causing eye irritation or scaring off the would-be predator. Moving from the coast into the interior, the broadhead skink has evolved a more fossorial lifestyle, spending massive chunks of their lifespans underground. Their red bodies are sensitive to vibrations, being able to sense what animals are walking above them. If the vibrations are small, they will attempt to strike and kill what's above it in a hunt. But if it is large, they will dig deeper to avoid being eaten. In order to be more efficient tunnelers, they have relatively large forelimbs with a tubular body. The hind limbs have atrophied, with only one or two claws being present on each hind limb, which are no longer used to walk on land. The most extremely specialized life forms that call the Red Desert home are arguably the rather amusingly named Puff Lizards. The Puff Lizard is a Texas Horned Lizard descendant that has some adaptations that make them predisposed to desert life, but find themselves frequently to be prey to a wide variety of animals. To prevent predation, the puff lizard has evolved a partially inflatable body, with large lungs and flexible ribs and spines allowing the organism to puff up and expand in size. A ridge of dorsal spikes can be erected upwards when puffed up, causing this lizard to be a lot harder and more painful to eat. The lizard is coated in spines on their side and tail as well, making them quite a painful target indeed. Puff lizards have become incredibly successful on Pariahs, with over 14 species across the desert. They eat insects mainly, but will also eat carrion, rodents, and vegetation when given the chance. The most derived and dangerous species of puff lizard is the puff walla, which has taken the inflatable nature of their ancestors and taken it to an extreme. An active set of enzymes in the puff walla are generated to produce toxins that make the animal extremely poisonous. Not only do they gain toxins by producing them on their own, but they will incorporate the venom from insects they eat allowing them to eventually become a toxic cocktail of poisons that can be deadly for any predator to eat. Due to this extreme level of defense, the species has spread outward beyond the desert, also calling the savanna northward of the desert their home. This spread has been relatively recent, but few animals risk to eat such a dangerous prey item. All of the animals, plants, and fungi depicted in this episode are comprehensive in the groups of life that call one of the most hostile environments on the continent their home. The Crimson Desert is a hostile place, but in the next episode, we will examine the most isolated environment on the continent. Tune in next time as we cover the island of Irene, the only major island proximal to Lucindo.
At every level, the planet of Nakare 1011C has seen many Earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment light years away from Earth. In just 5 million Parian years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and the series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Parias. Last episode, we examined the harsh and vast Crimson Desert on the western side of Lucindo. This episode, however, will take us to a small island in the Rift Valley between Lucindo and Belkrig, the nearest continent. Irene is a small island, around three-fourths the size of Taiwan, and is a primarily rocky island, with a large extinct volcanic peak being the highest point on the island. When humanity abandoned the planet of Parias, what would become Irene was part of the supercontinent, but after the rapid ocean level rise and continental drift, this highland became its own island, with an environmental upheaval emerging due to the heavy level of isolation. Irene, when looking at the continental shelf, appears to belong to the Belkrake plate. However, since the fauna of the island is mostly unique to the territory, and since Lucindo doesn't have any significant islands of its own, it will be covered in the Lucindan season of Parias. The climate on this small island is mild and tolerable, with warm, dry summers and cool, wet winters. Temperatures stay around 60 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, or 16 to 32 Celsius, year-round. Due to the mild conditions, the small size of the island has become the main problem affecting life that wants to find a home here, causing conditions to be radically different than the mainland. An example of the effects of island dwarfism can be seen in the dominant tree species on the island. The duly named dwarf oak is an oak species that has adapted to the small size of the island by shrinking in comparison to their ancestors. On Earth, they grew on the mainland at heights of over 18 meters, but on the island of Irene, 5 million years post-establishment on Parias, these trees grow no further than 12 meters. Due to the milder climate of Irene, the species has evolved a lessened cycle of estivation, only dropping their leaves at the end part of the dry season, around autumn time. Despite their smaller size, they are by far the largest native plant species on the island, and their acorns are an invaluable source of nutrients to the environment's food web. The dwarf oak is a key species for the survival of two epiphytic plants using the large woody body of the oak for their own self-gain. The Irinian tree bean is a large bean species that has descended from the black turtle bean and evolved to live on the trunks of dwarf oak trees. Being outcompeted by other plant species on the island, this small plant has adapted to survive by siphoning nutrients from oak trees and producing large plants and bean fruits. The body of the Irenian tree bean has turned into a vine-coated mess, wrapping around low branches and roots alike. The flowers produced by this species are uniquely large, alongside others on the island, in order to attract more generalist birds to pollinate them. This island completely lacks specialist pollinators, and requires larger and more generalized species in order to reproduce. Another species that has adapted to be an epiphyte is the spiderweb ivy, a species that forms vast webs of connected plants in a single colony. A colony of this species could cover more than one tree, depending on how close the trees are to each other, as this species grows on higher branches compared to the Irenian tree bean. To keep all the plants from falling off the tree, the spiderweb ivy has adapted hooks that connect to other members of the colony, keeping them and the host plant intact. Because of these hooks, 
but they can often provide protection for small birds from confrontation with their avian predators. On the ground, one of the species that found dominance in taking over any creek or water body regions is the irene moss, which have overground much of the undergrowth due to their lack of animal-assisted pollination required for their survival. They can be found on rocks, on the dirt, or anywhere on the island where enough moisture can be found. The moss is a clean, simple, and edible plant that humbly feeds the herbivores of the island. Another plant that has become the most iconic plant species on Irene is the uniquely flat and large Iranian giant blanket flower. This species has adapted large flowers that attract pollinators and consumers alike to spread themselves across the island. Due to the lack of grass species, these flowers have overtaken the grass niche and coat the island in large orange flowers when the wet season comes in the winter. During most of the year, this perennial flower species has a bunch of grass-like leaves strewn all over, but bloom around the same time after a large winter storm. The flowers in this species grow big but not tall, which makes sense due to the fact that they will only shoot up and bloom in specific circumstances allocating other resources to grow outward and not upward. All five of these plant species have become the majority of plant life on the island and are completely endemic to this part of the world alone. However, when looking at the other kingdoms and phyla, they may have some cross with some mainland species. The tuber oyster mushroom is a fungus species that is found quite commonly across Lucindo and Belcrake. This saprotrophic species is an essential decomposer, and its edible nature allows it to spread peacefully across the land with little opposition. This fungus is unique in that it, unlike other insular species, originated on Irene and found massive success outside its native homeland. Why is that? This is because the fungus has evolved a sclerodium, a hardened fungal mycelium that is used as a nutrient storage. This novel feature in this fungal lineage has two benefits that allowed this fungus to be very successful on Pariahs. One aspect that has affected their success is that this tuber-like organ acts as a storage unit of nutrients and water to keep it going no matter what conditions are thrown at the island. Another aspect that helps it be successful is that both the fruiting body and the pseudotuber are edible and nutrient-packed, which attract animals to eat it and get spores stuck on them in the process. Spreading the food around the region after gaining their fill on Irene. Due to this, the species thrives across a very large region, despite its humble origins on a small island in between two continents. The plant and fungal life have evolved to thrive on the Isle of Irene, but are the base of the ecosystem for the animal life to mark their own unique niches on the small land having to adapt to the extreme lack of space in comparison to the mainland. One of the species that are the exemplars of the effect of insular gigantism is the giant light beetle, a gargantuan species of firefly that has undergone an interesting evolutionary pathway to take advantage of multiple niches within a single lifespan. Laying eggs on carcasses and rotting material, this species specializes in eating carrion and other invertebrates as larvae. When they pupate and metamorphose into the adult stage, this species of giant beetle, capable of growing up to 15 centimeters, or half a foot long, eat fruits and acorns. Their gray bodies are covered in white and black speckles, 
which are unique to each individual specimen. When mating season happens in early summer, these large arthropods glow an orangish-red glow and spend days mating until exhausted. After mating season is over, these animals continue their lives whilst the next generation of fireflies grows wherever nutrition can be found. Another species of arthropod that lives on the island is the mailman fly, a detritivore that eats anything that most other animals find disgusting, with a preference for rotting fruit. Due to the reduced number of insectivores on the island, and more of a threat from giant light beetle larvae, these beetles have changed their parental strategy to survive. Having longer lifespans than their ancestral species, they evolve new parental strategies beyond laying eggs on a surface and abandoning them. When mailman fly maggots are almost ready to mature, the mother will bring them, one at a time, to a carcass or high nutrient detritus item. When the maggots are delivered to the perfect conditions to grow into their adult stage, the female will leave and attempt to mate almost immediately afterwards. Whilst these species are specialized to the island environment, there are some other invertebrates that have presence on the mainland as well as Irene. These species likely rafted to the island from the westernmost point of Bell Creek, the nearest landmass. One species that rafted across the sea is the Pyrefoot Snail, a small herbivore that has evolved eating toxic material to become extremely poisonous. Their bright shells are spotted with golden freckles and orangish gray skin. Whilst being a recent addition to the island's roster of life, they haven't been very successful in comparison to mainland species. One factor to this is the genetic bottleneck that came from the small number of individuals that rafted to the island, being carried along by their toxicity alone. Another problem outside of inbreeding that has harmed the population of Iranian snails is their poison is less potent than the mainland species, causing them to be occasionally predated by more generalist predators. Despite these downsides, these snails have become hardy enough to eke out a living on the island. Another recent addition to the ecosystem of Irene is the winged fire ant, a species of fire ant that has spiny outgrowths on their backside that makes them sharp and intimidating. At some point, a few fertile queens made it across the sea to the island of Irene and have become the most successful invertebrates on the island by sheer numbers. These opportunistic, omnivorous, and adaptable ants adapted to the vacant niches of eusocial insects and have evolved highly aggressive swarm behavior as a method to attack small birds, other arthropods, and even baby mammals. A species of fish calls the freshwater creeks and waterways of Irene their home. The Irene fingerbiter is a Texas Shiner descendant that has evolved to live in fresh and saltwater environments. During their juvenile life stage, they spend their time hiding in the kelp forests that surround the island. Adults of this species tend to live in freshwater environments instead attacking anything in the water that they can get their big mouths on, from insects to plants to even small snakes. Another species that finger biters have to keep an eye out for is a species of frog that can also be found in the waterways and moist regions of the island environment. The Irene Devil is a robust ambush predator 
and is yet another good example of insular gigantism. Taking advantage of the relative lack of mainland predators and lower gravity of Pariahs to become one of the largest frog species in the whole region, this frog can fall prey to larger avian predators that frequent the island, but may often raid nests when given the chance. The only reptile that can be found on the island is the giant green snake, a snake that has survived when others couldn't. When islands break from a mainland environment, environments can be uprooted and many niches get wiped out easier than elsewhere. However, smaller and adaptable species are the most likely to survive and become insular specialists. This is true for the giant green snake, becoming larger than their ancestor and adapting to eat anything they can catch. They are great climbers and swimmers and have a mixed diet of fish, crabs, and small birds. The mammals have made presence on the island of Irene as well. The dwarf spiral sheep is a fast-moving species that is an example of insular dwarfism. On the mainland, the species is larger and more diverse in numbers, but on the island the species has shrunk in size. This is due to the smaller amounts of resources on the island, alongside having to face large aerial predators. Despite being smaller than their mainland cousins, these animals are extremely fast, the fastest of all species on the island. These sheep have almost entirely lost their horns, being mere bumps on the males and absent on females. This species mates for life and holds their own small territory and are very affectionate to their partner. The Iranian pronghorn is a pronghorn descendant with a longer neck and thinner body size. They resemble a giraffe's body plan, but rather shrunken down overall. This is due to competition from the other mammal species on the island. The Iranian pronghorn assumes the medium-sized herbivore niche on the island, browsing more often on tree bean and the lower branches of dwarf oak. Unlike the dwarf spinal sheep, this organism retains the ancestral territorial and sexual dimorphic behavior. Males can be quite aggressive, most often to other males, but will sometimes attack other animals that enter their domain, which can backfire terribly when messing with something larger than they are. While the other mammal species on the island have evolved to get smaller, one species has evolved a larger body size. The giant peccary is a gargantuan peccary species that has become the largest mammal and animal on the island. This stocky herbivore can be up to 2 meters tall and up to 3 meters long, grazing across the land and consuming whatever they come across. They have a sweet tooth for the tuber-like fungi that grow on the island. Groups in this species consist of one male and one to four females, alongside their young. Males in this species have to defend their mates from other males that wish to take control of the harem. Males will hit each other on their sides until one gets too weak and knocked over by the dominant specimen. As adults, these peccaries have practically nothing to fear but each other but can fall prey to predators on the island, especially if they are juveniles. The most diverse group that can be found on the Isle of Irene are the birds, taking advantage over a variety of niches left vacant by other animals' extinction. Some of the birds are endemic to the island, living their entire lives on the small outcropping of rock. Others only visit and take advantage of the low-octane environment before flying away to other lands. 
One species that lives a lifestyle similar to the latter is the fruit moor duck, a primarily frugivorous bird species that eats fruits, seeds, and acorns. Acorns especially are a very common food source on Irene, causing these birds to use this location as a middle ground during their migratory patterns, which will be described in more detail in a future episode. In contrast to the migratory species, there are endemic birds that can be only found on the island. One of these is the Irenian giant Parias crake, or the Irenian crake, which is a flightless bird that has adapted to eat the numerous ants that can be found on the island, alongside snakes and eggs when given the chance. Both males and females of the species will defend their nests with high-pitched shrieks and aggressive behavior. Whilst being flightless, the Irenian crakes are great runners and swiftly run from predators when attacked. Another endemic flightless species is the giant doot, which thrives in the rivers and creeks of the island. Their large size and long necks make them great at consuming both aquatic and high vegetation, and also providing a level of protection against predatory birds that frequent the region for an easy meal. This species ultimately descended from the same ancestral duck species that the Irenian crake descends from. A small land goose also lives on the island. Typically, islands cause flightless birds to be larger than their mainland flighted relatives, but this is a unique anomaly that can be explained by two factors. The primary factor is competition from the other flightless birds on the island. The giant doot and the Irenian crake respectively take up the large browser and fast small herbivore niche, relegating this species to eating flowers, acorns, moss, and fallen fruits. Another factor is that this species is yet another rafter that showed up to the island recently, being already a flightless goose lineage from Belcrake. The apex predator of the island and one of the most dangerous aerial threats in the region is the giant shoebill. With a height of 1.6 meters and a wingspan of 3.5 meters, this bird is a true giant. The giant shoebill nears the maximum size a bird can reach on Parias while retaining the ability to fly. Their massive thick bills and muscular neck allows this bird to crunch down hard on prey either living or dead. Their bite force allows them to crack bones of small animals, which are their preferred prey. On Irene, their nesting grounds, they attack anything they can catch, even including juvenile giant peccaries. However, on the mainland on Lucindo or Belcrake, this species is more of a scavenger. This species is relatively migratory but typically makes nesting colonies on their home island on Irene. Recently, there have been nesting colonies on the mainland, but they appear to be less successful, being more prone to nest raids from small, opportunistic mammals. All of these animals form a complex yet fragile environment that is the island of Irene. These aren't the only species native to the island, and the waters around it, but are the most notable. Tune in next episode as we move back to the mainland of Lucindo and examine the least diverse region on the entire continent, the Spinal Mountains. At every level, the planet of Nakare 1011c has seen many earthling species evolve and adapt to a new environment 
light years away from Earth. In just a few million years, many animals have adapted into a variety of strange and unique forms, and this series will be dedicated to providing a window to this world of unguided evolution and natural history. Welcome to the abandoned world of Parias. Last episode, we examined the unique pressures brought to the life forms of the small island of Irene. This region is small, and due to the lack of resources, we see a variety of strange giants and dwarves. In this episode, we explore an environment even less diverse than that small isle, one with interesting constraints that affect life that tries to live there. The Spinal Mountains is an eroding mountain range that stretches as a line from northern to central Lucindo. And whilst the mountain range is taller than the Appalachians, these mountains are generally losing ground every year with heavy erosion. This mountain range has very cold climates year-round, with some temperature spikes and divots, causing some temporary snowfall. Some snow can be found in passings here and there, but the mountain range itself is losing more snow cover year after year. This montane region causes a massive barrier between the tropical rains in the east to the desert of the west, making these mountains the starting points for lakes and rivers through the rest of the continent. The Spinal Mountains are surrounded on all sides by either tropical savanna, a seasonal monsoon climate, or a hot desert. Due to this climate isolation, this causes a small degree of biogeographic isolation for the life forms that colonize these lands. The plant life has had some unique challenges to grow in this environment. The most immediate threat to plants trying to grow on the mountain lands is the heavy cold, being the coldest region on the continent on a yearly average. This cold region is surrounded by warm or tropical climates, so many plants have a disadvantage in adapting to this region. They also have to deal with the high altitude, which can have effects on how animal-assisted pollination affects angiosperms in particular. Because of all of these conditions, non-angiosperms have become the dominant plants in the region. The smallest and most humble plants that call the Spinal Mountains home is the Montane Moss. This moss species that thrives on the mountain can attribute their success due to lack of competition alongside the heavy rains on the eastern side of the mountains. Montane moss primarily reproduces by budding, where moss split apart by herbivores will grow into new colonies of moss. This, alongside the conditions of the mountains being rather hospitable for moss, has allowed this species to spread green across the rocks, cliffs, and crags of the Spinal Mountains. Another small, rather simple plant that does well in the brisk highlands of northern Lucindo is the cliff grass. Cliff grass is another goosegrass descendant that has adapted to grow on the worst terrain imaginable for a terrestrial plant. These grasses love growing on near vertical cliffs and in between rocks, growing slowly but surely in places where most other plants couldn't dream to grow in. The largest plant that makes a living on the mountains is the spine pine. The spine pine is a white spruce descendant that is the tallest plant in the region, capable of growing up to 60 meters in height or roughly 200 feet. This is due to the decent amount of rain 
alongside the lower gravity of Piraeus. However, this plant takes hundreds and hundreds of years to reach such great heights. This pine has adapted a cycle of two unique pine cones produced throughout an individual lifespan. The first of the pine cones produced are made with a smaller size, and the second pine cones produced are made giant in size, utilizing gravity to spread the ladder downhill. The giant pine cones can be a hazard for animals in the region, and can even sometimes cause small rock slides. The spine pine is not the only pine species that calls these mountains their domain. The creeping pine has marked its own niche as the small trees in the mountain lands. But something is off here. The creeping pine can be found in the plateaus of southern Lucindo. So how did these trees cross hundreds of kilometers across a large forest to get to the spinal mountains? This is due to the trees producing a lot of pine cones throughout a single life cycle. And these pine cones can be often brought by birds. All this plant needed was a single pine cone to be brought by a bird across the sky to new grounds and it could establish a population. This has appeared to happen not only on the Spinal Mountains, but some other highland regions as well. Another plant species that exists in the mountains and beyond them alike is a hardy species of fern. The alpine tuber fern is a Dickinsonia descendant that has adapted their bodies to a half-submerged bulb that is tough for animals to reach into. This fern has also adapted to estivate or drop their leaves whenever times are tough. They use the nutrients stored in the bulbous body to regrow leaves when times get better. This adaptation has allowed this plant to grow eastward down the mountains having a secondarily useful benefit that helps them in the drier and more seasonally affected monsoon scarlands, which will be described more in the next episode. The most specialized plant that can only exist in this environment is the tiger hole flax, a toad flax descendant that cannot survive for long anywhere else on Piraeus. This plant has a mutualistic, symbiotic relationship with the noble bee and has dedicated a lot of resources into accommodating its one and only pollinator. The tiger hole has a unique barrel-shaped flower with special stripes that attract noble bees to enter them and pollinate in the process. These plants move across the mountains pretty efficiently as their pollinator symbiont becomes more dependent on the flowers alone, to the point where their body shape makes them incapable of pollinating other flowers, both becoming specialized to each other alone in the process. The noble bee is a honeybee descendant that gains its name by queens inheriting and building multi-generational hives when the mother queen dies. The new queen will build upon the older queen's progress and make gargantuan nests that can only fall apart by a freak storm or an attack from mold. The fungi have made a presence on the mountains as well as plants. Chief among the fungal species on the spinal mountains is the common cap, a fungi that thrives across North Lucindo. The spinal mountains and the tropical savanna and jungles are both this fungi's home turf, and has been successful as one of the greatest decomposer species. 
This is a shiitake descendant, and it retains the aspect of being edible even millions of years after being abandoned by humanity. The fungi moved into more tropical environments in the process, but have increased competition down the mountain. The plants are the bottom of the food chain that the rest of the ecosystem relies on. The next rung on the food chain belongs to the primary consumers, which primarily are small and herbivorous. One great example of a small generalist is the spotted squirrel, a gray squirrel descendant that hasn't changed too much outside of their appearance and larger teeth. Their teeth are helpful in creating holes in giant trees for nesting or to hunt wood-eating bugs, and their funny-looking beards mark a specimen as sexually mature. The animals have also made a unique approach to adaptations and have made themselves successful in the region, dealing with a degree of isolation in comparison to the rest of mainland Lucindo. One such extreme example of isolation is the highest altitude fish species on Lucindo, which is the Never Shiner. The Never Shiner is a Texas Shiner descendant that has become dull in coloration and more of a generalist. This fish can be found in the high lakes and were a result of a population left behind up in the montane region when humans left the planet millions of years ago. This species of fish eat aquatic plants, algae, and tadpoles and are common prey to the birds that migrate to the mountains. A wood-eating herbivore that has to avoid the squirrels are the forest beetles, a beetle species that has evolved to eat wood for most of its life cycle. Larvae can spend years within a tree, either living or dead, and when they become adults, they eat fungi and pinecone seeds. This species has undergone fissurian runaway, with males being around double the size of females and a shiny emerald green color. Females in the species are a duller shade of green, which allows them to be targeted less frequently in comparison to the males. Because males are brought into adulthood with such a huge handicap, the shinier males are chosen by females because if a male beetle has made it this far, despite their shiny vibrancy and size, they have proven their fitness outright. The cobra ribbon fowl is a duck descendant that is the prime example of migratory birds in the Spinal Mountains. Many birds that spend most of their lives on lower altitudes will rise up to these northern peaks to lay their eggs in a lower intensity environment. The cobra ribbon fowl is one of many globalist species that can be found on all continents on Piraeus, and they thrive in almost any habitat. They also have very unique characteristics in sexual dimorphism, with males having extravagant traits that females lack, chief among them being the extreme neck feathers that give males their cobra-like name. The largest herbivore that exists in the region is the Lucindan wandering sheep which can be found in almost all environments across the continent of Lucindo. Their proneness to wandering made them great at colonizing environments, given enough low vegetation is present to feed a small group. These ram descendants tend to fight back, with thick horns on their heads being used more often on other species as they are on each other. 
they retain the bizarre ability of sheep and rams to be extremely good climbers, allowing herds to migrate upwards to the high mountains to exploit the lower density of predators. These sheep will be featured once more in future episodes, as they are truly one of the most dominant low grazers in central and southern Lucindo due to their unique suite of characteristics. However, the most successful herbivores in the mountain regions and in more tropical latitudes alike are the Rathouse, or Ratite Mouse. Originating near the deserts, this genus of deer mouse descendants have a unique bipedal walking gait. When the ancestors of Ratice first evolved, they began the road to bipedalism for more efficient running speed, alongside standing on their hind limbs facultatively to more easily detect predators. However, when this trait became more and more selected, this group quickly arose to success due to an abundance of open niches in the tropical climates. The ability to walk on two legs became used for a variety of purposes, with multiple species adapting their arms and bodies for different purposes and niches. One of the largest species of ratice in Lucindo is the snowy rathouse, a grayish-white herbivore that mostly eats plants but is willing to chomp on bugs when given the chance. This species uses its freed-up front limbs to help climb and grasp with long fingers and dexterous hands. The ratice, unlike their namesake, are a relatively smart group of mammals, capable of building complex nests and having social structures. The snowy ratice, given the environment they find themselves in, has resulted in a larger body size for a decrease in group size. Groups of snowy ratice are only about half a dozen strong, but each member can stand up to a meter tall and around 0.7 meters from head to tail. When confronted by predators, snowy ratice run to their nests made by fallen trees, rocks, and bones. The animals described previously form the primary consumer class of the food chain, and thus are vulnerable to predators whose diet is other animals. A more generalist omnivore that may be missed or even tripped over by larger animals is the rockadillo, a rocky armadillo that has evolved a uniquely asymmetric body that makes each individual look unique as their own rocks. Their body has unique dents and protrusions and is covered totally in gray scales and fur. This sometimes can cause the individual to have a less efficient walking speed, but most make do with how their bony shells are formed. Being the descendants of nine-banded armadillos, they can retain nine bands in their shell, but may have seven to six bands in modern times. Rockadillos are monogamous, with males and females caring for their pebbles or young rockadillos together. They stay together for at least one breeding season until the young leave the nest and the father leaves to mate with another female. These animals eat whatever they can find, from carcasses, to flowers, to fish, to moss. The ice frog is a unique amphibian that cannot be found anywhere else in the world. This frog, as tadpoles, eats algae in the water, and as adults eat beetles, bees, and unattended bird eggs. These frogs are very arboreal, and tend to be found over a dozen meters from the ground.
They spend most of the day relaxing in the high ground, and spend their nights attacking bugs and birds alike. When conditions get bad, these frogs can make a blanket of foam out of their own spit, which can help them hibernate for days or even weeks at a time. The spit is very foul smelling, so most animals will tend to leave them alone if discovered. Another member of the food chain is the stone snake, which is one of the largest colubrids of Lucindo. Stone snakes can be up to 3 meters long and use their large, thick bodies to stay warm. They eat juvenile rathouse, birds, and frogs when given the chance, and primarily use constriction to kill their prey. To hide from stronger predators, they use their rocky coloration as camouflage, but don't have any other means of defense outside of hiding away in abandoned rat house nests or rocky crags. They have a more active metabolism for a snake, which leads to a smaller lifespan and more active lifestyle. The secondary consumers play a key role in keeping primary consumers in check in a healthy ecosystem, but they themselves fall victim to the tertiary consumers, otherwise known as apex predators. On the peaks of the Spinal Mountains, there are two apex predators that focus on hunting different kinds of prey. One apex predator that is a threat to the ground animals is the menace bear, a black bear descendant with a more carnivorous lifestyle and aggressive saber teeth. Their hunting strategy has changed to overpowering their prey, pinning prey down and finishing them off with a swift and efficient bite to an artery with their giant canines. Due to the smaller population size, this species of black bear has blue eyes being common in the overall population. Male menace bears have longer fangs than the females, which they sometimes use to attack other males. Despite the large fangs in males, it is the females that actually hold territory that males compete for in order to mate. After birth, the male will leave for another territory, but the mother will keep her young safe for up to two years. Due to their large size, they can capture snakes, ratice, wandering sheep, or any other large game they may come across. Rockadillos are a hard challenge for most menace bears, but they can sometimes be overturned and stabbed to death in their vulnerable underbellies. The other apex predator of the Spine Mountains is the Great Mountain Eagle, a giant bald eagle that is hard to recognize from their white and brown ancestors. This species traded out the iconic colors for a more boring rocky gray, but that is not their only trait that makes them unique. They have thicker leg bones that allow attachment for strong muscles. These birds primarily kill with their knife-like talons and a vice grip that can lead to some interesting encounters. These smart birds can often grab prey and throw them off of cliffs, which can easily lead to the prey's death without much struggle on the eagle's behalf. These birds are primarily gliders, using wind currents to keep them afloat. Nests are often made in the gigantic spine pine, and can be so heavy it can cause the tree to lean. Often, this bird will raid rat house nests, not to kill the rat house inside, but to steal their hard work from the materials they collected for their own nests. 
Couples in this species mate for life, and often will die of grief when one partner dies. All of these animals form a complex food web and are thriving on the mountains. Not all of life in the mountains were described here in full, as there are a large assortment of migratory birds that rest here on their journeys to a different final destination. In the next episode, we follow the migration of birds downward from the mountain and onto the monsoon scarlands, a region with heavy canyons, rapid rivers, and extreme weather patterns. Thank you guys all for watching the video to the end. It really means a lot. If you can like, subscribe, and all that good stuff, it makes sure the channel has the momentum to keep going. These videos can take days or weeks to make, so if you could help by hitting that like button, it really helps. The link to the Pariah's Discord server can be found in the description and the pinned comment. Also, at the time of recording this video, I reached 1,009 subscribers, and all of you mean the world to me right now. Thank you guys so much for being here.